slowly moves its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of the new week. In the south, though, we will be holding on to those dry conditions for a time this afternoon. Perhaps a bit of late, hazy sunshine around, but it's in the northwest that we see those strongest winds and some blustery showers pushing their way south and eastwards through the early hours of Monday morning. The shower's always heaviest across northern and western parts, and we could even see some snow across the hills, and that will lead to quite a chilly night with temperatures in the low single figures here, and even further south, not reaching much above 7 or 8 degrees. So a chilly but blustery start to the day on Monday. The heaviest bands of showers clear their way south and eastwards through Monday morning, leaving some sunny spells as we head in towards the afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and again, these could turn to snow across the Pennines, Lake District, and across the high ground of Scotland, and with a brisk northwesterly breeze, it will be feeling very chilly. Highs in the south not reaching much above 12 or 13 degrees. Tuesday does start a little bit drier for most of us. There will still be a few showers around across Northern Ireland, Wales and northern parts of Scotland, but the best of the sunshine across central northern parts of England and much of mainland Scotland as well. A few showers around still on Wednesday, but there are hints of higher pressure returning later in the week and something a little bit milder on the way. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then, we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel treats for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel.
Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to GB News on TV, online, and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquia. Now, for the next few hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course, it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. Well, not without a good reason. But joining me in this hour is a broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly. That's in the next hour. I was a broadcaster and author Christine Hamilton. In a few moments' time, we'll be going head to head in a clash of minds in the clash with former Labour Party advisor Matthew Lazar, adults of businessman and activist Adam Brooks. We'll also uh, be starting the show, bringing you the latest from what's going on in Israel uh, and, of course, that terrible attack from Iran. Uh, as we'll speak to the Israeli defence official who revealed more than uh, 300 drones and missiles have been launched by Iran. Then at five, I'll be joined by this week's outside guest. Now, here's some clues. She puts the Mauritius on the map during the swinging 60s as her career blew up in England. But who do you think she is? That's a tiny, tiny teaser. We'll give you more. Well, I have a very, very special guest as well, joining me for my Sunday supplement at the end of the show. Morag McDougal Brown was taken away by the police after being falsely implicated in a hate crime. I'm looking forward to talking to her. But before we get started, let's get your latest news headlines. Nana, thank you very much and good afternoon to you from the newsroom just after three o'clock. And we start with the latest developments from the Middle East, where the Israeli war cabinet says it will exact a price from Iran for its overnight assault, warning Tehran will face a painful sanctions, including in the form of missiles. Iran, meanwhile, says it will launch a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. It comes as Rishi Sunak confirmed that RAF planes did shoot down a number of Iranian drones and missiles overnight in what he described as a dangerous escalation in tensions with Israel. The Prime Minister is now calling for calm ahead of a meeting with G7 world leaders today to discuss the Middle East crisis. This was a dangerous and unnecessary escalation which I've condemned in the strongest terms. Thanks to an international coordinated effort which the United Kingdom participated in, almost all of these missiles were intercepted, saving lives not just in Israel but in neighbouring countries like Jordan as well. The RAF sent additional planes to the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger. Well, the British-Iranian diaspora has responded to the attack overnight with a protest today outside the Iranian embassy in London to show their solidarity with Israel. So we, the British-Iranian diaspora, have gathered here today in protest to let the world know that the war of the mullahs, which has started for really, in reality, 45 years, but last night they launched over 300 missiles at Israel, is not the war of the people of Iran. And we are urging the public, the media and the rest of the world to recognise that this is the war of the mullahs and not the war of the people of Iran. One of the protesters there speaking moments ago in London. In other news, the knife attacker who killed six people at a shopping centre in Sydney advertised himself online as a male escort and we understand tried to join groups of gun owners online. The knife attacker who killed six people at that shopping centre has uh, been named as Joel Couchy and had been known to police, particularly over the last five years, but hadn't been arrested or charged before he committed the attack yesterday. Police believe the 40-year-old suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs, including methamphetamine and psychedelics. His family has now released a statement in support of the female police officer who shot and killed him. They say that she was only doing her job. Here in the UK, Labour says that it will impose strict 24-hour time limits on police when dealing with serious domestic abuse cases. The initiative's been dubbed Ranim's Law after 22-year-old Ranim Uday was killed by her former partner just 11 days after obtaining an order against him. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says she's sick and tired of the government treating violence against women and girls as inevitable instead of an emergency. 
A new poll suggests that Humza Youssef's popularity among SNP voters has fallen sharply. A survey of more than 1,000 people in Scotland found the First Minister's score fell to minus 7% among voters who had voted for the Scottish National Party in 2019. His approval with the general public has also dropped to similar levels as his Conservative rivals. It comes after the introduction of a new hate crime law prompted more than 7,000 complaints in just its first week. Yvette Cooper says that Angela Rayner has done the right thing by taking independent legal advice amid a row over her living arrangements. It's after her former chief advisor gave a statement to police contradicting the deputy Labour leader's claims. Police launched an investigation this week to determine if there were any breaches of electoral law. Miss Rayner says, though, she will step down if it's found that she has committed a crime, but insists she has followed the rules. Tur <clears throat> Excuse me. Turkish officials have launched an investigation and detained 13 people after a deadly cable car collision there. This, for those watching on TV, was the moment that a helicopter rescued one of the last remaining passengers stranded in mid-air. One person was killed, ten others were also injured when the cable car collided, with a broken pole ripping the pod open and sending people inside, plummeting to the rocks below. In total, 174 passengers were rescued during a massive 23-hour-long operation. And finally, some royal news. The Duke of Kent is stepping down as Colonel of the Scots Guards after 50 years. The Duke was cheered and applauded by troops as he attended his final Black Sunday parade in Westminster. Edward was appointed to the position in 1974 and now hands over the role to the Duke of Edinburgh. The 88-year-old says that holding the position has been a true honour. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, let's return to Nana. Thank you, Sam. It's just coming up to seven minutes after three o'clock. This is GB News. I'm Nana Aquina. Before we get stuck into our clash over the next hour, let me introduce you to my panel. Joining me today is former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza and also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. Right, so here's what we're discussing today. Rishi Sunak has confirmed RAF jets were used to intercept Iranian drones and missiles fired on Israel as tensions flare in the Middle East. We'll bring you the latest. Uh, former Prime Minister Liz Truss has claimed that she wasn't warned that the UK was sitting on a financial tinderbox when a Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng delivered the mini budget, although she was sort of Prime Minister, so she could have checked. Um, so was she really, though, wholly to blame for the market meltdown. Then, following a landmark ruling, Rishi Sunak has criticised the excessive reach of the ruling by the ECHR. Could this mean the Conservative Party will include pulling out of the ECHR in their manifesto? And uh, J.K. Rowling has accused politicians of snuggling up to trans campaigners and has called for an investigation. The Harry Potter author has called for an investigation into why political parties are embracing the language of pro-trans groups. Tell me what you think on everything we're discussing. As ever, go to our website, gbnews.com forward slash your say or tweet me at GB News. So it's time for The Clash. Uh, Rishi Sunak has confirmed that UK jets were used to intercept a number of Iranian drones. As I said, the RAF moved additional planes into the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. And I can confirm that a number of Iranian attack drones were shot down and we pay tribute to the bravery and the professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger to protect uh, civilians. Uh, I chaired a COBRA meeting on Friday to agree a plan of action. Well, the Prime Minister is calling for calm ahead of talks later with other world leaders. Israeli defence officials said more than 300 drones and missiles were launched by Iran in an unprecedented attack. And it is the first time Iran has targeted Israel directly from its own soil. Israel says it is prepared for further aggression, with Iran threatening a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. So now I'm joined by GB News' Home and Security editor Mark White. Uh, Mark, what gives us an update? What's the latest? Well, the Israeli War Cabinet has been meeting this afternoon. We've been hearing from Benny Gantz, one of the War Cabinet ministers, who said that Israel will exact a price from Iran. Uh, but an indication, perhaps, that any 
action that Israel may take might not be imminent because he said that Israel would build a coalition and then exact that price from Iran at a time of their choosing. Now, throughout the day, Israel authorities have been trying to assess the impact of these missile attacks and drone attacks that took place last night. Uh, 331 drones missiles, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles wow. that were launched not just from Iranian soil, but also launched from uh, Iraq, uh, from Syria and from Yemen. Uh, the vast majority, though, were intercepted, as you heard there, mm -hmm. from Rishi Sunak, intercepted, some of them by UK combat jets, the vast majority by the US uh, and their naval assets and their combat jets in the region. Uh, but Jordan as well and Saudi Arabia, we're told, also shot down uh, drones that were passing over their airspace. The rest, they were dealt with by Israel's own missile defence systems. And the vast majority of the missiles that made it as far as Israel were intercepted. Just seven ballistic missiles targeted an airbase in the south, an airbase that we're told uh, that was involved in launching those F-35 combat jets that uh, took out that diplomatic mission in Damascus on the 1st of April, uh, which is what Iran says uh, it has conducted these uh, strikes uh, in retaliation for. So all eyes really on Israel to see uh, just what the next steps will be. But as I say, from what Benny Gantz of the War Cabinet was saying, an indication perhaps that it might not be imminent. OK, Mark White, thank you very much. That's Mark White. White, he's our Home and Security Editor. Right, let's go live now to Tel Aviv and speak to performer and Mr. Fire Uri Geller. Uri, really good to talk to you. I'm glad to see that you are safe. Incredible, incredible work by Israel. Um, talk to me about the latest on the ground there. OK, first of all, you can imagine half of Israel did not sleep last night. Mm -hmm. Look, Nana, when I was on your show yesterday, I said Israel was braced for an attack by Iran. Well, last night it happened, as we all know. Iran unleashed more than 300 missiles, 300 missiles and drones. Just think about it, 170 killer drones. This is a swarm. Not only that, but also over 30 cruise missiles and more than, listen, 120 ballistic missiles. Now, think for a moment. This kind of an attack is enough to wipe out London, yes, this is what Israel was facing yesterday, last night. I don't know if you have seen the pictures, but the skies were lit up here in Israel. Iran even targeted Israel's, listen, secret nuclear plant at Dimona. My friend sent me a video of the skies there, full of flashes and bangs, and the sirens were wailing. You have the video, if you can show it later. What Iran did was to try to overwhelm Israel by bombarding it. But Nana, and listen to this, do you know what? 99%, and you've mm. said it before, of everything that was fired at Israel was shut down before it could reach Israel territory. Only a very few ballistic missiles made it through. Now, they landed at the Air Force base. There was, there was hardly any damage. There was, sadly, I didn't hear you mention this, there was only one casualty. An innocent seven-year-old Bedouin girl who was hit by shrapnel as she slept in her bed. This is heartbreaking. And we are all praying for her recovery. Now, look here. Do you see this is a painting, a Dali painting, and it's surreal. What happened last night here was surreal. I have a report from the government. The, I'll just say the first sentence. 85 tons of explosive were hurled at Israel yesterday. But look, Nana, think about this. We witnessed a, a miracle last night. Look, Iran pounded Israel, but almost nothing got through. OK, that's already unbelievable. Unbelievable. The missiles were blown up in the sky, and the drones and cruise missiles were shot down. This is incredible. But it wasn't just Israel, like you said, which did it, your own British forces, the RAF, as well as the U.S. Air Force, maybe France too, came to Israel's aid and shot them down. And not only that, now this is very important, but Jordan, 
Jordan, an Arab country, which we are at peace with, also help. Now, here is the final thing I want to say, and it's the most mind-blowing. Listen, now there's, this is the final thing, but it's the most important. Please visualize this. This is what I want to say, and I can't, you know, express myself how this, how important this is. We saw what happened last night, but can you imagine if it wasn't drones and missiles, but a nuclear weapon, which Iran had fired? Just imagine a nuclear weapon. Now, Israel would have to shoot it down, but what would happen? The missile would fall either on Jordan or Iraq or Syria or Turkey. And you know, mm. the radiation from such an explosion yeah. would blow across Europe. It could even reach the UK. Iran cannot be allowed to get nuclear weapons. It must be stopped. What happened last night proves it. It is a threat, Nana, to the entire world. And that's all I have to say. Well, listen, Uri, thank you so much. It was really good to see you are safe. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, and take care of yourself. Thank you so much. That's Bless Uri Geller, the incredible Uri Geller, telling us his view live in Israel last night. Right, let's welcome again to my clash as former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza and businessman and activist Adam Brooks. Adam Brooks, I'm going to come to you straight away, OK? So yeah. what were your thoughts on what happened well, last night? I, I stayed awake and listened to... I, I was awake to about three in the morning, no, no, and, and it took me back to when I was a child. I'm showing my age now. When I, before I used to go to school, I used to sit with my cereal before school and watch the Iraq War. You know, and at the time, it was sort of almost exciting but scary as a mm. kid. I found that again last night. You know, it was, it was compelling viewing, but I've got kids myself, so it was scary. What sort of future have we got? I can't believe, reading on Twitter, there are people that seem to defend Iran. They're the bad guys here. Mm. They really are. And this is not... I, I don't agree with everything Israel do either, but this is a country... Uh, ruled by people that want to wipe another country off the face of the earth. They've said it numerous times. They've spoke about the destruction of Israeli cities. These are not nice people. But, but where have you read that, just out of interest? From the past, I think uh, there, there's a few quotes from, is it uh, Mahmoud Ahmadajid? Uh, I can't even say, say the word. But... I mean, we've got many quotes from the leadership of Iran. Well, is, threatening. This, on, is this on Twitter? And no, this is, this is on, on, on the internet and, and Google, and I think I've read it in The Guardian uh, and many publications as well. They have threatened Israel in the past with strong words. Now, to send 300 missiles, mm. drones, as Yuri said, we could have seen, if that Iron Dome hadn't worked last night, we could have seen tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people, including children, die. This could have started World War III. It's that serious. I can so, almost hear the pro-Palestinian um, lobby saying, yes, but what about the people in Gaza, if you're that concerned about the thousands of people? Look, this could have look I mean, uh, we, we can go on about other conflicts around the world mm. that don't seem to be getting the, the traction in the media. Um, you know, uh, the Christians in Nigeria and, and different places that are... Even Ukraine, actually. In Ukraine. But, you know, I don't agree with what Israel is doing now. I think they needed to respond um, to October the 7th, but I think it, it's now got to the point where this has got to stop. And, but you, you can disagree with what Israel are doing at the moment and still call out the actions of Iran here. This isn't a, We can't just be tribal. This can't be like a, a football team. I'm blue, you're red, and, and we can't deviate here. Mm. This could have started World War Three last night. Well it, well, it may still have done, Matthew Lazar. Absolutely. I mean, I think what we what we need now is uh, cool heads. Actually, I don't always agree with this, Sunak, as you know, Nana. But I mm. think calling for cool and calm heads uh, over the next uh, uh, you know hours and days is, is really important. And I think we need that. And that needs to be the message to Israel as well. <laughs> It was such a successful operation last night of Israel and its allies crucially mm. working together to make sure that, you know, that the casualties were tragic though they are, uh, as low as they've been. Uh, and we need to hold that coalition together. We need to hold international support for Israel together. And therefore, I think it's right uh, that Israel makes the choice to respond calmly. I mean, Benny Gantz um, uh, has said that you know, Israel respond when the time is right. And that seems to me, uh, rather than being pushed into an immediate response, which is what Iran wants, taking, taking a step back, taking a breath, having uh, been proud of what Israel did 
started to defend itself uh, and realising that uh, retaliation doesn't mean firing more missiles tonight. Well, that's right. what Iran did, didn't they, apparently, because the event that they are responding to was on mm. the 1st yeah. of April. Yeah. But it does seem that everyone was told what was going to happen. So yeah. America knew, everybody knew. Yeah. So Iran are arguing that actually it went perfectly well for them. They didn't want to kill anybody. They just wanted to send a, a warning and they only targeted um, actual... You know, rather yeah, than I people. Yeah, th th that that's would be the line they quite... take. I think what they wanted was that they wouldn't. They would have known partly because they're giving notice, and partly because they know the capabilities that Israel and allies in the region have. Uh, but also uh, that they all weren't going to get through. All the uh, missiles weren't going to get through. But I think they would have hoped that at least uh, uh, some more mm. than they, they did get through, so that it would have been more of a show of defence. Yeah. I've been a little humiliated yeah. by what's happened. Do you, do you think they're humiliated, or perhaps no, they were I think genuinely what, what they've in... done by doing this, they've they've suddenly unified a group of allies mm. where it was tense. It was Absolutely. tense and it was frayed. The Thank relationships were frayed. Yeah. They've just unified a group and America uh, and the UK have shown that they're standing there together yeah. and that sent a message out to the world, I think. Well, I suppose the point is we are not going to tolerate watching mass destruction on that level, but then people who are in Gaza may argue, well, why, why were they not protected? But they have been, but I think in Gaza they just simply need to stop firing the missiles and give back the hostages. I mean, I suspect it would be all over if they did, but if you just tuned in 21 minutes after 3 o'clock, it's fast approaching. I'm Nana Akwit. This is GB News, live on TV, online and on digital radio. Coming up, Rishi Sunak has hit out uh, the quote, excessive reach of a ruling by the ECHR. But next, former Prime Minister Liz Truss says that she didn't know that the UK was sitting on a financial tinderbox when the mini-budget was announced. So, was she really to blame for the market meltdown? That's next. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit about Sebastian? Um, I just, it really amazes me how a mother um, who can lose a child in such a shocking and unexpected way, so little, so precious, can then turn that grief into something so positive. How did you find the strength to get up, um, get a camera crew, as you say, travel to the other side of the world and investigate all of this? Um, I was angry at Sebastian for dying. Um, you know, you feel like saying, God, I, yeah, 32 years later and I can still get very, very upset about it. I was angry that something, that, that while, he, while he was born and lived with me and slept and then died, they were actively campaigning in New Zealand to try and stop this happening because they had a very high cot death rate there. Um, they had the, the, the lady, uh, the Anne Diamond, if you like, of uh, New Zealand, a, a television presenter called Judy Bailey, went on telly every night and said, if you're just about to put your baby down to sleep, put him on his or her back, not the tummy, and this will help. And there, cot death rate plummeted. And I went out to New Zealand and met her, and it was anger that drove me to come back and demand that we have the same advert here, um, the same campaign. And, of course, I got all this complete nonsense from the Department of Health saying, you know, oh, young mothers do not watch television, I was told. In other words, while New Zealand mums were being told how to save their babies' lives. We actively denied British mums that advice wow. during the time that Sebastian and others were dying. And, and the other point I suppose to make is it's helpful to educate all generations because when I think when I had my mm. babies, my mum would say, oh, he's not settling, just stick him on his tummy, he'll be much happier, that's what we did with you. And we had to say, well, things have changed mm. and, you know, yes. but it's about educating everybody because it's not everybody, just the mums that get their hands on the babies. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Good afternoon. It's just coming up to 25 minutes after 3 o'clock. This is The Clash. I'm Nana Aquir. You're listening and watching GB News on TV online and on digital radio. Now, Liz Truss has claimed that she didn't know that the UK was sitting on a financial tinderbox. I think she's the only one. <laughs> oh, I think I knew. Uh, that was basically when Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng delivered the mini-budget. Now, the former Prime Minister has made the revelation in her new book. Uh, Liz says that she was astonished that nobody from the Treasury or Bank of England warned her that UK pension funds had invested heavily in risky assets, which left them at risk of going bust after the mini-budget. Now, the fallout, or the economic fallout from the mini-budget, was so disastrous that uh, Liz Truss resigned after just 49 days in office. But was she really to blame for the economic meltdown? A lot of people seem to think so. Let's welcome again uh, my uh, clashers, former Labour Party adviser Matthew Laza, and also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. Matthew Laza. I think they're extraordinary, uh, these uh, excerpts from Liz's books and the, and the interview she's been, Liz's mm. book and the interview she's been giving. I mean, as you say, she was Prime Minister. It's like uh, anybody else's fault but me. And I think if she wanted to rehabilitate herself, actually apologising, saying that she didn't get everything right and there were things she should have done, would have been a way back into, if not the British people's hearts, mm. at least they were the British people's uh, respect. Um, I, mean, they're, I mean, they're self deluding uh, at the, um, at the whole thing. She talks about the Queen and she sort of makes it all about her, saying, oh, it was terrible for me. I mean, to deal with that on the first day when it was worse for the for the for, for the royal family. I mean, I think that you know Liz really needs to take a vow of silence. She's trying to make a name for herself uh, in America. She's trying to say controversial things uh, to up her profile there. Uh, but really, um, she was prime minister. She needs to take responsibility, and that's what people look for. In yeah, but but you would say she was only prime minister for what was it, forty nine days? So so she can't be held responsible for the situation that she was set up in, like all the economic disaster. No, although she was Same of course, part of the cabinet. Um, yeah, and it yeah, but Rishi party. Sunak. Yeah, but, I mean, Rishi, yeah, absolutely. Rishi I'm not Sunak. saying that Rishi Sunak's let off either, because I think the Tories keep trying to pretend every time they get a new Prime Minister, it's a bit like a bus, you know, a three come along in it's one... It's not my fault, it's the one before. Um, <laughs> they need to take collective responsibility, and that includes Liz taking responsibility for what were her decisions, which was the mini-budget, for which mortgage holders like me are still paying the price. But you, but you must accept that mortgage rates were held ridiculously low. Absolutely. And they had to come up at some point. Yes. That would have been the right point. Unfortunately for Liz, she was the fall guy. And they, and they went up more than they would have otherwise by maybe half a percent more than they would have. I'm not saying that mortgage rates would have held where they were, so, but, but the impact would... of the mini-budget um, and the not thinking through the consequences for pension funds and the market reaction was what really was really did it first. So she needs to say sorry. Adam Brooks. Look, from the start, when, when the whole Boris thing was going on, mm. I said on this, on this channel and I said on Twitter that sometimes it's the better the devil you know. Mm. And I kept saying it, that you get rid of him, this is going to get a lot worse. And look what's happened. You know, you had Rishi Sunak plotting for over a year to get mm. rid of Boris. Yes. Registered the, the domain name uh, for his leadership. It's obvious that the establishment wanted their guy in power, no matter what. Mm. Now, Liz Truss was popular with members. Voters wanted her in. Mm. You know, she got the job. But I believe that a lot of this budget uh, was right, but I think the advisers stitched her up a lot with the optics and the way that it was delivered. And I believe, honestly, that powerful forces from uh, the establishment and maybe Rishi Sunak's banking contacts manipulated those markets uh, to make it worse, to force her out so there was no way for her to carry on. And it was an easy PR spin to, to the public to say, she's cost you your mortgage. It's Liz Trust that has hurt you in the pocket. Mm. And there's no going back for that. Once the population believes that one lady has cost them X amount of hundreds of pounds a month, it doesn't matter what's said afterwards, they're not going to believe it and they're not going to like her. Because it does seem a little bit unfair, because I'm reading today in the Telegraph that Tories fear Sunak is in the grip of super-rich donors. Yeah. And, of course, if that's his own party fearing that, mm. then I, I don't know how much truth is in this, but it's written yeah. there in the Daily Telegraph, it's there in the Sunday Telegraph today. And the point is that a lot of those rich donors will probably be people who, have, who own some of these banks or have some yeah. links with a There's lot of these power. banks. There's power out there that can move markets. There's favours that can be done. Let, let's not... You know, I used to work in the city many, many, two decades ago. You know, our economy was on a very fragile mm. line at that time. It, it didn't take a lot to move markets and to scare markets uh, one, one way. But let's not, let's not let off the OBR that consistently get things wrong. Yes. Let's not let off the Bank of England that were too slow to raise rates. America did it a lot faster than us. They also printed yeah. a lot of money, right. too so much. 
no one ever holds the Bank of England to account or the OBR. Policy is made on their decisions a lot of the time. But she didn't consult them, did she? No. She had but no... I, I also have to question the advisers, and I, I say it regularly on here. I believe our MPs are advised by some of the worst people out there. They're clueless. Do you think that Matthew Lusk... Uh, well, I, 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 Adam, when I was doing it to... You're, uh, you were a, a former, former advisor, advisor so I'll come to you. I, I know Adam <laughs> wouldn't tell me with that brush. Um, the, um, <laughs> the, uh, look, I think that Liz... You're right to the extent that I think that the Tory establishment never wanted Liz Truss. No. Mm. Uh, I think they wanted uh, Rishi, who is much more in line, and that obviously bringing Cameron back proves that, you know, he's part of the more, a more traditional Tory establishment. But I still think she needs to take responsibility for going too far, uh, uh, too fast, uh, and for the consequences of it. And just in terms of a rehabilitation, Mm. It's that taking responsibility, um, which will be... Well, they should good. all take responsibility, I think, a lot of them, including the Labour Party, who left the economy in such a tragic state when the Tory party picked it up. The global financial crisis. Yes, there. remember, that was you and Gordon Brown and all that. Not Gordon Brown saved, saved the global economy. What, by selling all the gold? He I believe not. our economy, economy would be in a better place if they'd left Boris where he was than we are now, and I think a lot of people will think that. OK, well, what do you think at home? GB views at gbnews.com. Oh, no, it's a new one. Sorry, I'll give you the new one in a minute. <laughs> but you're with me, I'm Nan Rakoy. This is GB News. Uh, next, Rishi Sunak has hit out at, and I quote this, excessive reach of a ruling of a ruling by the ECHR. But first, let's get your latest news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. It's 3.31. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. The Israeli war cabinet says it will exact a price from Iran for its overnight assault, warning Tehran will face painful sanctions, including in the form of missiles. Iran, meanwhile, says it will launch a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. Uh, but the US President Joe Biden's warned his Israeli counterpart, Benjamin Netanyahu, the US would not take part in any retaliatory strikes. It comes after Rishi Sunak confirmed RAF planes did shoot down a number of Iranian drones and missiles overnight in what he described as a dangerous escalation in tensions with Israel. Well, the Prime Minister is now calling for calm ahead of a meeting with G7 leaders. The knife attacker who killed six people at a shopping centre in Sydney advertised himself online as a male escort and tried to join groups of gun owners. Joel Couchy had been known to police particularly over the last five years, but hadn't been arrested or charged before yesterday's attack. Police believe the 40-year-old suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs, including methamphetamine and psychedelics. His family have released a statement in support of the police officer who shot and killed him, saying she was only doing her job. Labour says it will impose strict 24-hour time limits on police when dealing with serious domestic abuse cases. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says she's sick and tired of the government treating violence against women and girls as inevitable. But the government says Labour is soft on crime and doesn't have a plan to tackle it. And the Duke of Kent is stepping down as Colonel of the Scots Guards after 50 years. The Duke arrived at the regiment's Black Sunday parade in Westminster this morning. The 88-year-old says holding the position has been a true honour. More on all of our stories available on GB News Alerts. The QR code on your screen will get you there. Uh, and there's also more details on our website. Now back to Nana. Thank you, Aaron. Coming up, should we be embarrassed about the state of affairs in our own military as tensions overseas continue to escalate? Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. There is a, a, a kind of a Mediterranean side to that as well, because my mother came from that side, you know, a, a big family. And I think there is that sense of community where family is kind of key. And I think that's really kind of what we sort of try and continue, really. I mean, certainly with children and stuff like that, you know, Sunday lunches were always, you know, the big thing. Yeah, <laughs> really. but if you go down the Old Camp Road today... Very different. Very different, yeah. And that was quite some time ago as well, because we were very close to where the Tom Beckett was. Yeah, uh, I know. Uh, I know, the boxing and, um, upstairs and all yeah, the rest of it. Yep, 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 yep. And, um, and I did go down there not so long ago, actually, and it really is very, very different. I mean, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. I think we have a different view of things. In Most sense. people in London, Nicky, don't even know the names of the next-door neighbours. No, true. We've that's completely lost that sense of community that you grew up with, yeah. that you knew. 
I think it's a real problem. Yeah, I mean, I have to say sometimes I'm a bit guilty of it where I am now as well. You live in big houses, and yeah, I yeah. do see my neighbours, but, you know, it's not quite the same as it was back... Now, I guess from that background, you're a teenager, you want to become a hairdresser. Yeah, that's, That must that, have been that, quite a difficult call. Yeah, that one was a really good, a really good call. My dad went, oh, God, what? I mean, it was just very funny. And, and, and certainly from the point of view of, you know, this was the early 70s. And yeah. So it wasn't really the kind of the choice of most, that most people would do. No, but you did. But, and why? I don't know, actually. I mean, I actually, I went to a grammar school and um, I didn't do as well in the final um, uh, exams. And I was kind of forced into sort of leaving. And you suddenly go, ooh no idea what to do here, really. Yeah. But the idea of doing something in fashion. And, you know, I really kind of... I, I know that I was given some really good advice, actually, by somebody that said, just start at the bottom. Don't necessarily go to, you know, college or whatever. Not, there may not be anything wrong with those, but just start at the bottom. Go to the best place you can and start sweeping the floor. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon. Welcome back. It's just coming up to 37 minutes after 3 o'clock. If you've just tuned in, great to have your company. I'm Nana Aquir. Now, listen, on the way in the clash, this next topic. Rishi Sunak has criticised the excessive reach of an illegitimate ruling by the European Court of Human Rights, or the ECHR, which oversees the duty of governments to achieve net zero. Now, this comes following a landmark ruling that governments have a duty to protect people from climate change. The Prime Minister's comments are expected to fuel continuing speculation that the Conservative Party will include pulling out of the ECHR in their manifesto. So, welcome again to my clash. As former Labour Party adviser Matthew Laza, and also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. Adam Brooks, I'm coming to you first. <coughs> Stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the aircon. So, what do you think? Do you think Rishi's right and, and uh, former no. the, the Tory manifesto should say that I, we should be I, pulling out of the I ECHR? I don't believe a word Rishi Sunak says. I do not believe he has mm. any intention of leaving the ECHR. I, it is my opinion that we should leave the ECHR. It, it is neither what it, it was set up for after mm. a World War II, um, and I believe it has manifested into something that is a monster mm. now, like the EU grew into something where it shouldn't have been. I, I believe the ECHR now believes it can set law rather than interpret law. And I mean, we've seen the recent ruling of the climate change madness in mm. Switzerland. They've used Article 8, which wasn't designed for anything like climate change. So it's being abused. Their, their, their legislation is being abused by lawyers to, to, to use it against things that it's not and, meant and to be used for. And can you clarify Article 8? A lot of people will be asking. They've used Article 8. What, Article what 8, it? yeah. I'm, I'm not a, a, a lawmaker, but I've, I've read that Article 8 was used here um, to, to force governments um, to do more to protect their people on climate change. Now, Article 8 has also been used um, for asylum, failed asylum seekers mm. in this country that That's we have to time. house them. I so, so there's such a broad, how, can, how can it be used for housing of asylum seekers and also for climate change? Mm. I mean, this is... I mean, this court is... Uh, a British uh, judge in Stras Strasbourg has already said that it's gone beneath... Uh, beyond its remit. But a lot of people so, argue, though, that um, the ECHR was set up by... Us lot, in so. different times. Yeah. So again, I, I said it has grown into something. It's grown into a monster, like the EU did. It, it, it's a power grab. It's now trying to tell governments what it has to do. Remember, we've got terrorists that we haven't been able to deport because of ECHR rulings. Mm. Um, this a foreign court should not have the power 
over us as a country to rule our borders or set our laws. But we don't see, even when we are in charge, so, I mean, what do we do? We've had, let's take net zero, let's talk about the 2030 deadline that we brought forward foolishly. Mm. The EU kept it at 2035, then we rolled back on ourselves. Even when we have the opportunity to ignore it, we seem to follow mm. EU or ECHR rulings. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the problems about Rishi flagging again today, or number 10 flagging again today, they might leave. I mean, they've been saying this mm. since they came to power in 2010. We've had, you know, a decade and a half of promises to leave the ECHR. Now, I don't think we should leave the ECHR because I think it's wrongly blamed uh, 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 for a lot of things. Because, as you say, it wasn't the ECHR that made us uh, set the net zero target. It isn't. The we ECHR. did it. Yeah, exactly. So there are things that we do ourselves, which is sometimes when people, when it turns out they're not very popular, people are looking for somebody to shift the blame to, then they try and shift the blame to the ECHR. I mean, I do think that the, the ruling this week is slightly ridiculous. But on the other hand, it doesn't actually mean that any government has to do anything. It's just a sort of slightly embarrassing. Um, uh, it doesn't. It's, it's not going to uh, force governments to do X, Y, or, or Z. So, uh, well, if you don't, though, then they say, "Oh, you're breaking international they take, well, law." We do, we do that because what, because I made a documentary about the ECHR um, over ten years ago, mm. and the uh, the big issue then was votes for prisoners because we were told mm. by the ECHR that we had the, we had to give prisoners the vote. Uh, they ruled on it. There's cross party agreement here. That's not a good idea, and we haven't done it, and we're still here, and prisoners. Still yeah, don't but, have the but vote. net zero seems to have taken on a sort of root of its own. Well, it's a cult like it's, it's a cult like it, movement. Yeah, net zero uh, because people have signed up to. It because mm. they because they made that political choice. Now, regret, Rishi's obviously regretting that, having changed it back again, but it wasn't the ECHR's but fault. Let's remember, no, no, that this lefty argument that I get on Twitter and, and on here on debate sometimes, that suddenly if we leave the ECHR, we're, we're like Russia. Hold on, America, Australia, New Zealand, mm. they're not ruled by the ECHR. You know, they're, they're not committing um, crimes against their people. This, this is a ridiculous, ridiculous argument that if we leave the ECHR that suddenly people are losing all their human rights. That's not going to be the case. We can bring it in-house. We're a civilised country. We do not need a foreign court telling us what we can and can't do. How can we not deport a dangerous terrorist because a foreign court, a judge that we don't even know, never met, Says, well, there is a British judge. I mean, a British yeah. judge serves on it yeah. uh, at all times. It's not a foreign court. It's an international court of which we've signed up to and we mm. play our part in. I mean, I think we need to make sure British politicians take responsibility for what happens at home. I know what you mean about Australia and the States, mm. but I think there are some human rights in the States um, uh, that, um, uh, that, that I would actually quite like it if they had some but, recourse to the ECHR. And the mm. key thing is, in Europe, we need to show leadership, and that's not the EU, that's Europe as a continent, because this is what Churchill um, uh, set up after the Second different World War. Times, so, Matthew, so, different times, Matthew. Well, I think we can look at look at reform of the European Convention on Human Rights, I think, and if we were playing a more active part and not saying we're in, we're out, and never actually but leaving, maybe we could do it. It's like the EU never wanted to negotiate with Cameron back in the day. It's all right saying this. The, these organisations do not want to negotiate. They do not want to give power away. All they want is more power. I don't think they want to negotiate with people who want to pull out, and that was the issue with Cameron, and that would be the issue with the European Court now. But I think, uh, going back to Sunak, he's never going to leave agree the on ECHR. That. Absolutely. He can put in, you know, I totally. don't think he should be the candidate that takes us into a general election. I honestly do believe, and you're going to disagree, that if we went with someone like Suella Braverman and we went heavy on immigration, said that it's a promise that we're going to leave the ECHR, the polls would tighten considerably. But at the moment, no one believes a word Rishi Sunak says, and every day these polls are going to get worse and worse, and they're going to be annihilated at the next election. So they've I, I got mean, a decision to the, make. On the outcome, I mean, if they went for Suella, I think they would win some report, some support back from reform. They might lose a little bit uh, on the other side of the uh, of the equation to the Lib Dems. Probably it might be a net I I increase. I think the problem with Rishi is he's trying to be all things to all people, and he's not keeping either the right of the party or the the left. He makes party. promises that he cannot totally. keep, and he's done that since his leadership. Campaign. Absolutely. Well, he made a very stupid promise about stopping the boats. If we all knew, still was, coming. Well, we all knew that that was an impossible thing to say to do, and so he should have been way more intelligent in realising that that was a very stupid pledge. But lots of you have been getting in touch with your views, and remember, you can get in touch gbnews.com forward slash your say. Uh, Paula says that uh, Truss was stitched up. Sunak thought the party members would vote him. When they didn't, he had to get her out, then banned the party members voting so he could squat in number ten. Tim says. Says Nana, the attack last night was has been enabled by years of appeasement, starting with Obama and ending with Biden. Only Trump saw Iran for what it is. And Mark says, whilst Iran gets itself weakened by conflicts, Saudi Arabia will become a superpower, and that is heavily backed by the West. And hopefully. 
the West will keep it that way and respect what they offer. They are a trump card for the future, should there be future conflicts. And Liz says, we've left ourselves with limited resources on being able to defend ourselves, but all NATO countries rely on each other for support, and this has made us feel invincible. Well, um, what do you think? I don't know whether we uh, should be that comfortable about it, but there's also a poll up on Twitter today and throughout the show asking, were we right to send jets to Israel's aid? Uh, don't forget to get in touch in the usual way. Oh, well, so carry on. Coming up. <laughs> Let's do it then. My monologue is on the way. Uh, would we be able to protect ourselves if Israel, uh, if the shoe was on the other foot? That's the question I'm asking. But next, JK Rowling has accused politicians of snuggling up to trans campaigners. So is it time to ditch campaign groups such as Stonewall and Mermaids? Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So higher pressure out towards the south does bring us some more settled conditions for a time this afternoon, but low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK slowly moves its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of the new week. In the south, though, we will be holding on to those drier conditions for a time this afternoon. Perhaps a bit of late hazy sunshine around, but it's in the northwest that we see those strongest winds and some blustery showers pushing their way south and eastwards through the early hours of Monday morning. The showers always heaviest across northern and western parts, and we could even see some snow across the hills, and that will lead to quite a chilly night with temperatures in the low single figures here, and even further south, not reaching much above seven or eight degrees. So a chilly but blustery start to the day on Monday. The heaviest bands of showers clear their way south and eastwards through Monday morning, leaving some sunny spells as we head in towards the afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and again, these could turn to snow across the Pennines, Lake District, and across the high ground of Scotland, and with a brisk northwesterly breeze, it will be feeling very chilly. Highs in the south not reaching much above 12 or 13 degrees. Tuesday does start a little bit drier for most of us. There will still be a few showers around across Northern Ireland, Wales and northern parts of Scotland, but the best of the sunshine across central northern parts of England and much of mainland Scotland as well. A few showers around still on Wednesday, but there are hints of higher pressure returning later in the week and something a little bit milder on the way. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon and welcome on board. This is GB News. If you just tuned in, where have you been? I oh, know. We are the People's Channel. I'm Nana O'Quare, live on TV, online and on digital radio. This is The Clash. Now, J.K. Rowling has accused politicians of snuggling up to trans campaigners. The Harry Potter author has called for an investigation into why political parties are embracing the language of pro-trans groups. Now, she says that Stonewall and Mermaids, these are some of the groups, have been given privileged places at the table. And many suggest that the likes of Stonewall have faced instances where they have appeared to contradict their own policies in the past. 
So is it time to ditch campaign groups such as those? Well, welcome again to my clash as former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza, and also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. Well, I know Adam feels strongly about this, so I'm going to have to come to you straight away and then I'll come to you, Matthew. Look, I think recent events, uh, the Cass report has proven a lot of us right. There is a very sinister trans and gender ideology agenda out there, and there has been for many years. Mm. Um, as a father, I'm horrified that it's reached schools and that it's, uh, it's harmed children so badly. Mm. I mean, people like Stonewall or groups like Stonewall and Mermaids have basically encouraged the, to ignore uh, the damaging effects of puberty blockers. Yeah. And it's, it's like we've been bombarded with this encouragement that all things trans is normal. Let's just remember, to change gender or to be trans is not normal. This is not normal to do this. This is an extreme behaviour that uh, many, many have mental health illness. Uh, there's a lot with autism. Mm. You know, these are people that maybe need support rather than encouragement to change what they think is their gender and, and, and what they are. Or just give um, them time to grow, because a mean, lot of it's during puberty, uh, isn't it? Uh, yeah, a lot of celebs, um, a lot of politicians should feel very ashamed mm -hmm. at how they've facilitated this agenda to be pushed and especially reach our schools and our adverts and our, our, our corporations, you know, uh, uh, and push on to our children. I think this is one of the biggest scandals mm. that we will see in decades. And J.K. Rowling is, she's like a one woman army that is just exposing this. Some of the tweets that she, she's put out there, you know, mm. she's exposing mermaids as having sent uh, chest binders Terrible. to 13 year old girls. Uh, and she's, she's exposing Stonewall's CEO, you know, he's saying one thing, trying to ride back, reverse ferreting on, on what they've said in the past. They're guilty of pushing harmful uh, well, well, policies they, on children. But they would argue that they are trying to help and protect these children, and these children are, you know, going through something and they're assisting. Matthew Larson. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the CAS report is really welcome. I think there's been a huge amount of agreement, including from some uh, trans rights campaigners, that there's an awful lot of good in the CAS report. And uh, mm. I think we all agreed that the uh, previous situation with the um, uh, with the clinic was certainly unacceptable, and that what was going on in that uh, in, the, in, in, in the Portman service wasn't uh, uh, acceptable. So. I, I think that I'm more concerned about mermaids, which is currently under a charity commission uh, investigation, uh, and some of the reports, if they're to be believed, like sending out chest binders, are more alarming. Mm. I think on Stonewall, which has been has done such great work uh, over the past 30 years uh, uh, on LGBT rights, mm. I think it has, has done a, uh, needs to be protected. Um, but I think it needs to look at itself in terms of those contradictions you've spoken of, where sometimes it's seen... It's, it did a thing saying two-year-olds um, should be taught about 50 different genders, and that seemed to contradict another piece of advice. It said two-year-olds could be trans. Now, that, that is one of the most horrifying things I read today. Actually, J.K. Rowling tweeted that out there. To say that a two-year-old can think that they can be another gender, when my four-year-old still thinks she's Elsa on some days. You yeah. know, there's no common sense. And, and it, to me, it's I very... Think it was very badly phrased, it's, very, it's very sinister that these people actually believe that these kids want to change gender. And, and unfortunately, out there, there are parents that almost see a trans kid as a fashion accessory now. And I think this whole um, agenda has pushed on people that this is normal to change gender. And we have to push back. And as I said earlier, to be trans is not normal. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't agree it's with that extreme. phrasing. I think, no, I think it's, it's I think extreme. It's a big step, Adam, but there are clearly people throughout history uh, uh, who, who have uh, been But it's trans. not normal behaviour, is it? I think, for, I think as far as children are concerned, children need to be given the space uh, to, um, uh, to explore the world, and that can mm. include experimenting with, uh, you know, um, uh, breaking previous gender stereotypes. That doesn't mean that people should be sort of labelled at the age of two, which I completely uh, disagree mm. with. Uh, and I think that what we need to say is I'm sure that Stonewall will come into line Line with the uh, with what the cast report have said, and I hope that we can all be more, more positive because members of the trans community do need support. Mm. Um, um, but that is different to some of the mistakes that were being but made previously. I, th I think what does a lot of harm to the trans community are some of these trans activists. You know, they mask up, they black up, and they go to women's rights events and they threaten them. I mean, the trans activists online and on Twitter are some of the most vile and aggressive people that I've encountered 
on, on my 15 years on there. I think there's horrible scenes where, uh, you know, blokes in um, uh, in balaclavas are trying to close women down, but it's still, mm. we need to make sure the trans community... It's toxic. I think it's very toxic from that side. Mm, well, it is awful, isn't it? And I, know I hate the bit, the whole the trans women are women when they were arguing and shouting and, and being aggressive to the likes of Kelly J. Keane and everything. It's totally unacceptable. But uh, uh, what are your views? GB views at gbnews.com. Uh, now, tell me what you think on everything we're discussing. It's gbnews.com forward slash your say or tweet me at GB News. Uh, now, the organisations would say that they're doing important work to support transgender young people, and that's how they would see it, but a lot of people don't see it that way. I'm now at a crystal to come. The Great British Debate this out. I'm asking, were we right to send jets to Israel? What are your views? I'd love to hear your thoughts. But first, let's get an update with your weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So higher pressure out towards the south does bring us some more settled conditions for a time this afternoon. But low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK slowly moves its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of the new week. In the south, though, we will be holding on to those drier conditions for a time this afternoon. Perhaps a bit of late hazy sunshine around, but it's in the northwest that we see those strongest winds and some blustery showers pushing their way south and eastwards through the early hours of Monday morning. The showers always heaviest across northern and western parts, and we could even see some snow across the hills, and that will lead to quite a chilly night with temperatures in the low single figures here, and even further south, not reaching much above seven or eight degrees. So a chilly but blustery start to the day on Monday. The heaviest bands of showers clear their way south and eastwards through Monday morning, leaving some sunny spells as we head in towards the afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and again, these could turn to snow across the Pennines, Lake District, and across the high ground of Scotland. And with a brisk northwesterly breeze, it will be feeling very chilly. Highs in the south not reaching much above 12 or 13 degrees. Tuesday does start a little bit drier for most of us. There will still be a few showers around across Northern Ireland, Wales and northern parts of Scotland, but the best of the sunshine across central northern parts of England and much of mainland Scotland as well. A few showers around still on Wednesday, but there are hints of higher pressure returning later in the week and something a little bit milder on the way. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good afternoon. You're watching and listening to yeah, GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Queer. Now, still to come in the next hour, my monologue. Uh, I'm asking, I'm talking about whether you think that we'd be able to protect ourselves the way that Israel has if the shoe were on the other foot after that onslaught from Iran. So what are your thoughts? Get in touch as ever. GBnews.com forward slash your say yes. But the fabulous Danny and Christine Hamilton will be on the way. First, we'll get an update with your news. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made what my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9pm only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, it's four o'clock. Welcome to GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. And for the next two hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course, it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me today, it's broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly, and also author and broadcaster Christine Hamilton. Up next, my monologue, if the shoe were on the other foot, would we be able to protect ourselves the way Israel has after their attacks by Iran? And today, my outside guest now will be joined by one of showbiz's most captivating leading ladies, with roles alongside the likes of Peter Sellers and Kirk Douglas, and appearances in TV shows like Coronation Street and Mind Your Language. My special guest today became a cult figure of the 70s, but can you guess who she is? Then, on Supplement Sunday, I have a very special guest joining me to talk about her experience of the hate crime hell. 74-year-old Morag McDougall-Brown was carted off by the cops after being wrongly accused of a hate crime, as many fear the SNP's hate crime law is being exploited. But before we do all that, let's get your latest news. Good afternoon to you. It's a minute past four. I'm Aaron Armstrong. The Israeli War Cabinet says it will exact a price from Iran in response to last night's attack when the time is right. It's not clear how Israel will respond, but its War Cabinet says painful sanctions will follow, which could include missiles. Iran, meanwhile, says it has now achieved its objective, but has vowed to launch a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. Rishi Sunak confirmed RAF planes did shoot down a number of the 300 Iranian drones and missiles launched overnight. He says, had it been successful, the fallout for regional stability would be hard to overstate. The Prime Minister is calling for calm ahead of a meeting with G7 world leaders to discuss the crisis. This was a dangerous and unnecessary escalation, which I've condemned in the strongest terms. Thanks to an international coordinated effort, which the United Kingdom participated in, almost all of these missiles were intercepted, saving lives not just in Israel, but in neighboring countries like Jordan as well. The RAF sent additional planes to the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger. A group of British Iranians have responded to the attack with a demonstration outside the Iranian embassy in London to show solidarity with Israel. We, the British Iranian diaspora, have gathered here today in protest to let the world know that the war of the mullahs, which has started for really, in reality, 45 years, but last night they launched over 300 missiles at Israel, is not the war of the people of Iran. And we are urging the public, the media and the rest of the world to recognise that this is the war of the mullahs and not the war of the people of Iran. 
The knife attacker who killed six people at a shopping centre in Sydney advertised himself online as a male escort and tried to join groups of gun owners. Joel Couchy had been known to police, particularly over the last five years, but hadn't been arrested or charged before yesterday's attack. Police believe the 40-year-old suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs including methamphetamine and psychedelics. His family released a statement in support of the police officer who shot and killed him, saying she was only doing her job. The Cabinet Minister has insisted the government's Rwanda plans on track, with flights due to take off within weeks. Health Secretary Victoria Atkins says the Home Office is ready to go, despite the trouble bill still making its way through Parliament. No airline's been named to transport the asylum seekers after Rwanda's state-owned carrier turned down a request. The Prime Minister has repeatedly said the flights would take off by spring, although no date has been set. Labour says it will impose strict 24-hour time limits on police when dealing with serious domestic abuse cases. The initiative has been dubbed Raneem's Law after the 22-year-old Raneem Uda, who was killed by her former partner just 11 days after obtaining an order against him. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says she's sick and tired of the government treating violence against women and girls as inevitable instead of an emergency. But the government says Labour is soft on crime and doesn't have a plan to tackle it. Well, Yvette Cooper also says Angela Rayner has done the right thing by taking independent legal advice amid a row over her living arrangements. It's after her former chief advisor gave a statement to police contradicting the deputy Labour leader's claims. Police launched an investigation this week to determine if there had been any breaches of electoral law. And Ms Rayner says she'll step down if she's found to have committed a crime, but insists she's followed the rules. A new poll suggests Hamza Yusuf's popularity among SNP voters has fallen sharply. A survey of more than 1,000 people in Scotland found the First Minister's score fell to minus 7% amongst those who voted for the SNP in 2019. His approval with the general public also dropped to levels similar to his Conservative rivals. It comes after the introduction of a new hate crime law prompted more than 7,000 complaints in its first week. More on our stories in our later bulletins or more right now if you want by scanning the QR code on your screen for GB News alerts or going to our website for more details. Now it's back to Nana. Thank you, Aaron. Good afternoon. It's just coming up to seven minutes after four o'clock. I'm Nana Aguirre. This is GB News on TV online and on digital radio. Brave Israel. Now, that's an army. That's how you protect your people, brave Israel. We in this country should be embarrassed about the state of affairs of our own. Yes, we came to Israel's aid, but it got me thinking as I watched the battle unfold overnight, and I'm afraid to say it, but I can't say we'd be able to protect ourselves the way Israel has if the shoe were on the other foot. Our armed forces are in a mess. We are not geared for war. We don't have bunkers, early warning systems, and any coordination at all. Regardless of your view of whether you think Israel are right or wrong, they know how to protect their citizens. And it is clear to me that their people come first, that their government, and again, put aside your views on Benjamin Netanyahu, that the Israeli government know how to protect its people. And we in this country need to take a leaf out of that book, because if the bombardment that happened to Israel happened here in the UK, I'm afraid I don't think there would be anything left of this country. Wherever your stance is on Gaza, whilst Hamas continued to fire rockets at Israel and hold hostages in tunnels and bunkers, Israel remains intact because Israel invested in an iron dome, unlike Hamas, who invested in fungus-infested tunnels. Without the dome, Israel, who was protecting its people from all angles, Hamas, the Houthis and Hezbollah, basically things that begin with an H, would have been flattened last night until the letter I got involved, and that's Iran. Invoking Article 51 of the UN Charter, Iran unleashed Operation True Promise, a decision made by Iran's National Security Council in response to an attack that killed its officials on April Fool's Day at the Iranian embassy in Damascus in Syria. Now, the Supreme Leader warned that Iran would respond decisively. Since October the 7th, Israeli military have killed 17 Iranian officials in targeted attacks in Syria, Lebanon and, and the like. But the attack in Damascus was the final straw for the, Israel, for the Iranian officials. 
And last night was the first time in Iran's history that it had been taken actual direct action rather than by proxy. The Iranian foreign minister posted on X that the USA were given plenty of warning. So there are no surprises. And many thought that Iranian proxies would respond. But last night it unleashed some 300 rockets on Israel. Now, as you can see, unprecedented scenes. And some of you, if you're not listening on radio, these are the rockets. This is a clip that Uri Geller sent me uh, from uh, live from Tel Aviv. For Iran to launch direct attacks over Israel instead of using proxies is unprecedented. And Israel have been fielding rockets from all sides on a daily basis because it dared to hold Hamas to account. Whilst I do not condone killing anyone, if you believe Israel's war in Gaza is over the top, I would argue that their targeted attacks on officials who are directly involved with potentially coordinating the war against them is preferable to firing rockets at Gaza. I think it's time that the UK got real about the state of its own armed forces. Last night should have been a wake-up call. The message was clear, don't mess with Israel. But sadly, the same could not be said for us here in the UK. Right, so before we get stuck into the debates, here's what else is coming up today. For the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, were we right to send jets to Israel's aid? Rishi Sunak has confirmed UK jets were used to intercept a number of Iranian drones and missiles fired at Ira Israel in an unprecedented attack. It's the first time that Iran has targeted Israel directly from its own soil. So for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, were we right to send jets to Israel's aid? Then at 4.50, it's Worldview. We'll get the latest updates from the Middle East as drone and missile strikes from Iran escalate further tension. I'll be joined live in the studio by Gary Mond and James Marlow to get their thoughts. And we'll also cross live uh, to speak to Paul Dudrid, host of the Politics People podcast on The View in the States. As Israeli military says, 99% of Iran's 300 missiles were intercepted during last night's attack. Then at five, it's my outside, my mystery guest. I'll join, be joined by one of showbiz's most captivating leading ladies from dancing on the top, on top of the pops in the swinging 60s London to achieving cult status as a model and actress in the 70s. Her career has been nothing short of adventurous. Can you guess who she is? That's coming up in the next hour. Tell me what you think on everything we're discussing. TVnews.com forward slash your say. Right, let's get started. Let's welcome again to my panel, broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly and also author and broadcaster Christine Hamilton. Christine Hamilton, I'm going to start with you. What are your, your thoughts then on, on our, the state of our armed forces when you see what happened last night and the way Israel had coordinated with the rest of the world? Jordan were on board, uh, you know, they, America were on board, the UK, we participated as well, but the final line of defence was their own Iron Dome system. Well, the first duty of any government is to defend its citizens, and Israel clearly understands that. They have perhaps more reason to be as that vigilant than, than, than we do, but we neglect all that at our peril. I mean, we've allowed our armed forces to run right down, and Europe as a whole has depended on America. And way back, I mean, John F. Kennedy was warning Europe, you've got to pick up your own baton, you've got to look after yourselves. And now Trump is still is beating the drum again, you've got to spend the money. We are the only ones that do, the rest of Europe doesn't. We cannot expect America to go on defending us. We need to spend a lot more money on defence. I mean, it, it's laughable. We've got one aircraft carrier that, I can't remember, doesn't work. Well, the other leave crew? Did it, it, get it, any crew on it? Got a rusty anchor <laughs> they didn't know how to use it. <laughs> you know, one, one's got no crew. It's, it's, it is unbelievable for, for Britain that used to be such a, a very embarrassing, a really proud seafaring nation. Our navy used to rule the world. Uh, so, yes, it's, uh, and we've got to defend Israel. It's, an, it's a democratic bulwark against Islamic extremism in an incredibly volatile part of the world. And, of course, these Middle Eastern players are proxies for Russia, proxies for China. Before we know where we well, are... some of them are, not some, all of them. Not all of them. No, and no, and no, let's, let's no. be honest, some of them came to Israel's aid not allowing um, Iran to fly in their airspace, and I think that must mean that they shot down some of those rockets. And it wasn't just Iran. Iraq, I think, were involved in, in all of this against Israel. They must... Yemen. 
they must have known that they weren't going to get any through. I think as much as anything, it, right. was a, it was a shot across the bows. It was uh, symbolic. Symbolic, yes. That's I don't... Well, a shot across the bows was an unprecedented drone attack of over 330 missiles. I don't think that's a shot across the but, bows. But they're but powered by, basically, they... motorcycle engines. They only travel about 100 miles an hour. I think... Look, I'm not... Oh, a they're fairly miles easy miles to intercept. Yeah, they're incredibly easy to intercept. To intercept. They yeah. could have destroyed... If that was coming to the UK... But we, they got the... Iron... Yeah, uh, but they know the Israel's got... The point got is... The, the point is... I yeah. am Armed forces I'm looking if, at. If, if, if mm. we had a neighbour who wanted to obliterate us and send rockets, we would have an Iron Dome. If we had a neighbour who wanted to exterminate us, we would have bunkers. But so, there are plenty of people who probably want to exterminate us, and we are not prepared. We I, don't even know. Well, where, where would you go if you heard a, 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 a siren for war? But there would be a pub, I should think. Well, in the London, you'd go, to a, <laughs> you'd go to a tube station or something like they Maybe did in the. Bed. <laughs> like they did in the Blitz. You'd go to a tube station like they did in the Blitz, but there was plenty of warning. We would have plenty of warning if we thought that we were under an yes, imminent but, threat. But you so, say that, but we are not prepared. Like, like if I had that, nobody. There's, there's like. In Israel, they have... Listen, if you hear this, this happens, you've got the yes, phone message, you've got this, you've got that. They're organised. That's because, because they have hostile neighbours. Yeah. I think it's inappropriate to compare the current plight of the British military with what Israel are doing. Oh, they've got why? national service, they've got hundreds of thousands of young people why who are it? forced to sign up, and they're, they're under a, attack, basically, 24 hours a seven. So I don't think it was right to say Israel got an Iron Dome and we haven't, because, well, we just I don't need say one. That. I no, said that. But you were comparing the two if militaries. We, if we had an onslaught, an attack like that... We would have an iron dome. But we haven't, though. We would, but, if, but we haven't. I we, bet you we have. You don't know. You don't know. No, no, but if you we don't were know. under the... Sorry, let me finish. You don't know, right, but not whether... You. Hang on. You don't know what I'm going to say, for starters. I'll have a guess. Can I have a guess? Go on. You don't know if we've got an iron dome? No. I, OK. There you go. I'm sorry. There you go. I'm not that simple. No, you <laughs> don't know, right, whether there's going to be an attack or not. And that's the whole point of it, right? You also don't know Russia... You, Russia could decide to attack China. Any of these hostile forces. The bottom line is preparation is king. We're not prepared for anything, Danny. May I just come back to you? How do you know we're not prepared? <laughs> How do you know that we're not prepared? All right. And you, you two are underestimating our military. I don't I'm want to get jingoistic. I'm not underestimating our military. I'm, I'm not like a jingoist. Overestimate it. Listen, I, I don't wish... want to get jingoistic about this, but I, I think you shouldn't underestimate our military. I'm not underestimating them. But I'm Daddy, saying we're not ready. We just What's that? Take... It's not we haven't got the it's not numbers. It's reality. <laughs> Of course, we don't, of course, we don't know exactly <laughs> what's going on in, in our d defence mechanism, but we know the reality of the numbers, for example. We know we've only got, what is it, 80,000 soldiers. We haven't even got an army. Apparently, the definition of an army is 100,000. We haven't even got that. We know the raw facts are not good. But as Danny says... Israel is in a battle... It's in a 24-7 battle for survival, That's constantly. Right. There are people out there who just want to completely obliterate Did... Israel. We don't have that threat, but that's not to say that we shouldn't be prepared for well, that Well, listen, sort look of at China. Threat. China are not in yeah. a situation where they are, are, are being attacked 24-7, are they? Yet, they have protection. They've set up their army. They've done everything. Russia were not in that situation either, but then they decided to go and attack Ukraine. But all these different countries who are deeply prepared, Finland, all these countries are prepared. We are not prepared. That is my point. The you British... don't even know what to do if there's an alarm sound that says that you need to go... If there's a, if, I don't even know what the but siren sounds like. No, no, no. If Russia launches a nuke today, you're right, we're screwed. No-one has given us any warning. Hopefully the British military and the CIA, that's the American intelligence and MI5, they would have boots on the ground to, to tell us, look, you need to prepare. Just like Israel, at the Yanks told Israel that Iran was going to launch a load of drones. So there is intelligence. There are intelligence yeah. capabilities. We, we, yeah, two and weeks later. Do you think we can get that ready in two weeks? We would depend. Well, hopefully, that would be silly, too. Danny. But hopefully, Nana, we would have that information and the, and the government would... Like they did when I was a kid in the 70s, the government told us that on the adverts. The they that said, look, the if you get a nuclear bomb, hide under we your kitchen prepared. table. We were prepared in the 70s. We we're are... not now, Christine. No, I, I, I agree with Nana. We are well, you woefully... Would, wouldn't you? No, I wouldn't. It's true. Always. Then. We are woefully <laughs> ill-prepared. We have allowed our armed forces to run down. People who go into the services are, are derided. They used to be looked up to... We don't even treat our veterans properly, for goodness sake. And we have allowed this situation... We've got to put much more money into I, defence. I, I, I think... We've got to accept that we're on the verge of World War Three. for heaven's sake. We don't... Oh, don't say that. Do you think we are? Yes, I do. Mm. Yes. It's incredibly... Like, listen, watching I that do. I think the world unfold is last night was very, so depressing. Yeah. Very, very volatile place, the world I, at the moment. I, I wish Israel would just, would, would just not retaliate. 
So mm. I think it was symbolic from Iran, and I would just like Israel to say, OK, we've had a bloody nose, we gave them a bloody nose, what? no more retaliation. What about, what about releasing the hostages, hostages for a how start? About, well, look, how, about, um, how about... Iran Hamas, aren't interested in the hostages. About, how about Hamas release the hostages and stop the fight? Yeah, stop but, stop, we, stop we, firing rockets. But, but we're not we'll talking about Hamas, no, we we're are. talking about Iran. No, we are, because this is all about Hamas, isn't yeah. it? And, and let's be honest, they're proxies for Iran. So, Correct. So, but, but Hamas need to release the hostages Those and stop the fight. Those projectiles were launched not to do with Hamas, mass or the hostages, they were launched in retaliation for an Israeli strike that killed two generals. On commanders who probably organised a lot of the things through Hamas. So that's why. We've played into their hands too. I mean, America gave them billions of dollars, Tehran, gave billions of dollars. I know they had to get hostages back, but if you start paying for hostages, where does it end? Well, where does I'm it afraid end? Right have now, to Christine, be tough. it ends now. <laughs> 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 this is TV News. Welcome. It's just coming up to 19 minutes after 4 o'clock. I'm Nana of Queer. We're live on TV online and on digital radio. Coming up, we'll continue the discussion uh, in World of View. We'll get the latest from Israel and Iran as tensions rise. Gary Mond and James Marlow will be live in the studio. We'll also cross live to Los Angeles to get the view from the States. But next, it's time for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, were we right to send jets to Israel's aid? I've got a poll up right now on X asking you that very question. Were we right to send jets to Israel? Israel's aid. Get in touch as well with your views at gbnews.com forward slash your say. Tell me what you think. Also, you can go online at GB News. Cast your vote now. Yes, we were. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. The perception of a crime being committed um, is not based on whether that person intended to commit a crime or not. But whether the victim, in inverted commas, uh, or anybody else for that matter who happened to hear whatever was said, uh, determines that um, it was motivated by malice or ill will. Most of these things come out in, in heated exchanges or in you know, very casual exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, and then somebody says, oh, I'm offended or I'm hurt or I'm whatever because this was clearly uh, malicious and it's against me as a... Uh, a, a black person um, or a, a transgender uh, or sexual uh, sexuality, whatever it might be, and somebody says, I perceive this to be uh, motivated by hate. Mm. Now, at that point, the, what is the reasonable test um, that anybody could apply as to what was in somebody's mind at the time. You don't know what I'm thinking now. I don't know what you're thinking now. Why is it that a crime can be committed on the basis of what somebody is alleged to be thinking? Well, that's also how discrimination often works, because people have worked out these days that saying something or sending an email like one I received some years ago that said, let's go round her place with pickaxe handles and balaclavas and see what we can do. Now, that's an email that was sent about me. People have worked out that you don't do that. But from the circumstance of what happens, if racial taunts were being shouted, if taunts about someone's protective, protective characteristic were being shouted in the run-up to what then happened, it would be pretty obvious that that was a hate crime. But we know, for example, that street preachers have been arrested, uh, merely for quoting the Bible, um, and without actually intending you know, anything beyond that. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Good afternoon. Just coming up to 23 minutes after 4 o'clock, and Nana Aquare. This is GB News. Let's see what you've been saying. Uh, Danny says, killing 1,000, uh, 14,000, sorry, kids is not defending yourself. Israel leaders, Israeli leaders uh, know that Hamas leaders are not even in Gaza and meet with them regularly in Qatar, Lebanon, and Egypt. By all means, go after terrorists, but don't bomb innocent people whilst claiming to be the victim. Um, they would argue that Hamas are hiding behind their people. So, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's war, isn't it? Hannah says there is no chance the UK would have been able to protect the country the same way Israel has done, especially with the current defence budget, which will be the same, if not worse, under Labour. Also, the UK would be attacked internally as well, mostly from the same people who constantly seem to hate the UK but enjoy the freedoms and benefits of security that they were unable to achieve elsewhere in the world. Good point as well. And, of course, our own civil servants who won't go out and fire the rockets. Let's not forget they won't allow that either, remember. Andy says what happened last night in Israel is a daily occurrence in Ukraine. Iran and Russia are terrorist states and must be treated as such. The UK and the USA both launched aircraft to intercept Iranian drones and cruise and defend uh, Israel against attack by Iran. Why are the UK and USA not doing the same to defend Ukraine against attacks by Russia? Very good question. Well, keep your thoughts coming, but it's time now for the Great British Debate this hour. And we continue on the theme, and I'm asking, were we right to send jets to Israel's aid? Rishi Sunak confirmed this morning that the UK jets were used to intercept a number of Iranian drones launched at Israel. As I said, the RAF moved additional planes into the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. And I can confirm that a number of Iranian attack drones were shot down and we pay tribute to the bravery and the professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger to protect uh, civilians. Uh, I chaired a COBRA meeting on Friday to agree a plan of action. Well, Israeli defence officials said that more than 300 drones and missiles were launched by Iran in an unprecedented attack, and it was the first time Iran has targeted Israel directly from its own soil. Now, the Israeli's Minister of Defence, Yoran Gallant, said that the confrontation with Iran is not over yet, and Rishi Sunak has vowed to continue standing up for Israel's security and the regional stability of the area. So, for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, were we right to send jets to Israel's aid? Well, joining me to discuss, Matthew Laza, former Labour Party adviser, Adam Brooks, businessman and activist, Ivor Kaplan, former Labour Defence Minister, and Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Crawford, a political commentator and former SNP member. Uh, Stuart Crawford, can I start with you? Were we right to send those jets? Uh, on balance, uh, I think the answer to that is yes, uh, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, Britain's biggest ally, both politically and militarily, is the USA. The USA's biggest ally in the Middle East is Israel. And it's inevitable that where the US uh, decides to take military action, the UK will usually follow. Not always, but usually follow. So I think it was inevitable that we, we would take sides, um, although arguably we could have stayed neutral. Uh, but also we have to remember, and the Prime Minister has already made the point, that we already have RAF Typhoon jets in action every day in the Middle East over Syria and Iraq. Mm. And it may be that they compensated for US assets doing the same job, being diverted elsewhere to protect Israel. So I think on balance, the answer is yes. And of course, the real um, result is that um, with the, the terrible uh, exception of the, the poor child who has been seriously injured, mm. uh, there were no deaths in Israel. Yeah, I mean, that's all testament to the hard work of all the different nations that got together to protect it. But uh, Ivor Kaplan, former Labour Defence Minister, what's your view on it? Oh, well, I'm very pleased to hear what, uh, what we've done. I think that was absolutely essential that we, um, we went and, and did what we had promised we would to Israel. Uh, and I think when you, when you see um, a, a group of uh, nations like the US, obviously, but also including France, including Jordan uh, and, and including Australia and other places, I think that's really, really good for, mm. for international uh, defence uh, matters. Now, obviously, and I was listening to your debate just beforehand, uh, Nana, and, and there was obviously debate about what happens next to the defence budget. That is critical because these kind of things cost money. Mm. And to do that, we're going to have to be able to do it in that way. 
Mm, yeah, interesting. Yeah. What about you, um, Matthew Laza? Where, where, where do you stand with this? Were we right to do this? Yeah, I think we were absolutely right uh, to do it last night. And I'm glad that, as you say, Nana, that the British uh, action, uh, along with allies and Israel itself, has resulted in this just one sad casualty. But uh, obviously, it could have been a lot, lot worse. I think, though, we shouldn't give a blank check uh, uh, to Israel. Uh, we should never give a blank check to anybody. And therefore, it needs to be important how Israel responds now. We want to make sure that Israel doesn't escalate the situation. Um, and if they do, if the right wing in the Netanyahu cabinet push him into doing something stupid, we need to be, uh, you know, we need to assess our support on a case by case basis. Uh, but generally, we should be supportive uh, uh, of Israel, and we did the right thing yesterday. Adam Brooks. Look, let's remember, we, we've all seen the videos and, and, and the pictures from last night. I was up till 3, 3 a.m. watching this. Mm. There was 300 missiles and drones uh, collectively sent towards Israel. Now, if, if all of those had landed, we, we could have been seeing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of casualties, including children. So really, anyone that wanted to avert death, uh, and especially child deaths, should be supporting the UK, doing their bit to stop that. And, and we played a part in shooting down some of these drones or missiles, and it was the right thing to do. Let's remember, they are an ally. If someone attacked the UK, we'd expect France, if they could, if they had jets in, in their airspace, to defend us. Mm. So it is no difference here, and I think the right thing was done. Stuart, I'm going to come back to Stuart Crawford. Uh, earlier we were talking about whether this country is prepared and there was a bit of a discussion. I mean, do you think that if something like that were to be happening here in the UK, uh, do you think we need to be pre prepared for the potential of something like that happening here? Well, I think it would be very wise. I mean, uh, mm. as far as I'm aware, there is no yeah. uh, defence against ballistic missile attack uh, on the UK. Uh, although there is an argument that some of our T-45 destroyers might have that capability very soon. But there is, there is no ground-based air defence of the UK, ge generally speaking. And I, was, uh, I also listened to the debate previously and, and was interested in saying it could never happen here. And of course, I think we have to look at what happened uh, to Israel uh, last night. The attack came from all directions, mm -hmm. and the same could happen to the UK. It's not just going to be cruise missiles and drones launched from Russia across Europe to, to attack the UK, if it ever happens. They'll be launched from submarines from the sea, from warships in the sea, mm -hmm. from all directions, and we're very poorly prepared yeah. to defend against that sort of threat. Yeah. I, I, would you agree with that, yeah. that we're poorly prepared? I don't think there's any doubt we're poorly prepared. Yeah. I mean, the numbers in, uh, in in our military since 2010 have dropped significantly, and it is significantly, and that means that if we want to have uh, operations like this, uh, mm. it's OK because, you know, the RAF obviously can take the aeroplanes out, but for everything else, you know, we don't have the army we had uh, 14 years ago, and I think that's an important... Uh, step that uh, whoever wins the general election, I hope Labour, of course, uh, to that, that they can uh, make sure that we, we can uh, once again grow the armed forces. Yeah. Well, listen, Ivor, thank you so much for talking to us. That's Ivor Kaplan, he's the former Labour Defence Minister, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Crawford, uh, political commentator and former SMP member. Uh, SMP, not SMP, what the M's? Uh, Adam Brooks, businessman and activist, and also Matthew Lowes, a former Labour Party advisor. Thank you so much uh, for your thoughts. It'd be interesting to see what the viewers and listeners think about that as well. If you just tuned in, welcome on board. Let's see what you've been saying. Gordon says, do you think others would help us if we were at war. Yeah, I, I, I question whether they would. You know, Paula says, yes, we did the right thing by sending jets. I hope we send more. Brian says we support our allies as we expect them to support us. It's all for one and one for all. We'll keep those thoughts coming at gbnews.com forward slash your say. Uh, I'm Nana Aquir. This is GB News Live on TV, online and on digital radio. So to come, we'll continue with the Great British debate this hour. And I'm asking, were we right to send jets to Israel's aid? You'll hear the thoughts of my panel. But first, let's get your latest news headlines. It's 4.31. Good afternoon to you. I'm Aaron Armstrong. The Israeli war cabinet says it will exact a price from Iran for its overnight assault, a warning that Tehran will face painful sanctions, including in the form of missiles. Iran, meanwhile, says it will launch a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. But President Biden's warned his counterpart, Benjamin Netanyahu, 
that the US will not take part in retaliatory strikes. It comes after Rishi Sunak confirmed RAF planes did shoot down a number of Iranian drones and missiles overnight in what he has described as a dangerous escalation in tensions with Israel. The Prime Minister is now calling for calm ahead of a meeting with G7 world leaders. More than 120,000 people have crossed the English Channel by small boat since 2018. It's after 219 arrivals were recorded by the Home Office yesterday. The total for this year is now 17% higher than at the same time last year. Labour's shadow immigration minister Stephen Kinnock has called it another grim milestone and says Britain must strengthen its border security. Labour says it will impose strict 24-hour time limits on police when dealing with serious domestic abuse cases. Shadow Home Secretary Vet Cooper says she's sick and tired of the government treating violence against women and girls as inevitable. But the government says Labour is soft on crime and doesn't have a plan to tackle it. The family of a man who killed six people in a stabbing spree at a shopping centre in Sydney has described his actions as truly horrific. Police believe 40-year-old Joel Couchy suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs including methamphetamine and psychedelics. His family have released a statement in support of the police officer who shot and killed him, saying she was only doing her job. And the Duke of Kent is stepping down as Colonel of the Scots Guards after 50 years. The Duke arrived at the regiment's Black Sunday Parade in Westminster earlier. The 88-year-old says holding the position has been a true honour. Right, more on all of our stories uh, on GB News Alerts. You can get those by signing up to the QR code on your screen or finding the information on our website. Now, uh, we'll be back with Nana in a short moment after a break. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. TFL bosses have come under fire after banning an advert... Oh, God. <laughs> they banned an advert for a comedy show because it had a hot dog on it, because that supposedly promotes obesity. The comedian Ed Gamble has swapped the image of the fast food favourite in favour of a cucumber instead. And there's the cucumber on the plate. So, is the UK turning into a nanny state? Let's talk to former presenter of Fat Families, Steve Miller, and nutritionist Olivia Parry. Good to see you both this morning. Olivia, it's a comedy show. Um, he's not promoting eating hot dogs, is he? Is this just a load of nonsense? The thing is, we have a huge problem with overweight and obesity in this country. We're fourth in Europe. Um, it's big business. Advertising for food companies is big business. They make, you know, they make so much money. You just have to switch on primetime TV to watch, you know, food after food advertisements. And we, it, it's for the youngsters as well who don't have the nutritional education. We're not taught cookery in school anymore. People go to go to college and to university. They don't know how to cook. But and it leads forgive me, to, forgive like, me for jumping in, Olivia. Left. Forgive me for jumping in. But the, but the, the whole point with this is it's an advert for a comedy show. Yes, I know. But this is a this is a wider issue. I think it's a load of old tosh. To be quite honest with you. It's a hot dog. In fact, I wish they'd have put onions on the hot dog. A bit of what you fancy won't hurt you. You should eat 80-20 anyway. You know, we talk about a nanny state. I actually think, arguably, we're becoming an authoritarian state. Opinions banned. Comedy banned. The England flag banned. It's like we've got to wear a virtual muzzle. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. If you just joined me, welcome. This is GB News. We are the People's Channel. I'm Nana Aquarius. Just coming up to 38 minutes after 4 o'clock. And it's time now to continue with the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, will we right to send jets to Israel's aid? Now, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak confirmed this morning that the UK jets were used to intercept a number of Iranian drones launched at Israel. Israeli defence officials said more than 300 drones and missiles were launched by Iran in an unprecedented attack. <coughs> Excuse me. Richie Sunak has vowed to continue standing up for Israel's security and working to ensure stability in the region. So, for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, will we write to send jets to Israel's aid? Well, let's see what my panel maker that I'm joined now by broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly and also author and broadcaster Christine Hamilton. Right, well, I'll start with you, Danny Kelly. Will we write? Yeah, the, the jets were in the region. They're allies of ours. It's not like they were used to fire anything at Iran. You know, they were basically used to wipe these things out of the sky. So I, I think that the jets were there. So, yeah, good for them. They saved, saved lives. Yeah. Um, but, again, I go back to an earlier point about... I think it was symbolic of Iran. I think they knew they were going to be taken out of the, <coughs> out of the sky. Excuse me. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're across the Ukraine story, you'll know how relatively... I'm going to use the word straightforward, but some actually do get through, mm. but relatively straightforward cruise missiles are taken out of the sky. So when you have one of these suicide drones that travel at a... It's, it's got... Do you know they've got a 125cc motorbike engine in them? Mm. You know, you, you can do just... a lot sit, of damage, it, though. Mm, probably a marksman could take one out. No, I don't think so. It's not I that bet easy. you if you had a machine gun. No, remember the shrapnel. What, in the sky? Are you mad? Do you know how high up that is? Uh, I think they were only about, say, 600 feet in the air. I saw a video of it. Yeah. They weren't that high up. You could see from the video how high up they were. Stop yourself. Well, they, they were... <laughs> Stop talking. You don't know what you're saying. I I know what what you're saying. I'm certainly not getting involved in, the, are, look. In, in the technicalities of them. But, yes, of course we were 100% right. Stanley said Israel is an ally of ours. This wasn't an offensive attack. This was defensive. We were helping an ally to defend themselves. And I also think that, that um, Iran knew exactly what was going to happen. Yeah. Because Israel's Iron Dome is so well known. I mean, the whole world knows that Israel has got... This invisible dome protecting its citizens. So they must have known that, well, apparently 99% were defended. Yeah. America has apparently said that they prevented 99% of them, but apparently we also are claiming well, we prevented some of them. So they can argue the toss. But what matters is the Allies prevented them. What a defence system, that Iron Dome. Well, it's so. amazing, but there, there it's so layers. sad that they have to have it, isn't it? Nana's an expert on the Iron no, Dome. No, there are three gonna... layers, though. So you've got the American layer of protection first, then you've got the British, then the Iron Dome was literally the final sort of layer of protection to make sure. So there's yeah. a, a triple layer there. What have we got? Um, the, 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 the phrase that always rings to me in, in, about the Middle East is, is um, Golda Meir, who said, if the Arabs lay down their arms, there will be no fighting. If Israel lays down her arms, there will be no Israel. And that is what they're up against, and that is what they're having to defend, defend, defend. They're not attacking, they're defending. And I think they have every right to defend themselves after what happened on the 7th of October. And, and, and where listen, are these hostages? I, 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 Iranian, they're, they're not Arabs, they're Persians. They're well. Persians, they're Persians, by the way. This show is nothing without you and your views. Let's welcome our great British voices there. Opportunity to be on the show and tell us what they think about the topics we're discussing. Let's go, where should we go to? The home of Should we go to... Oh, should we go to Kidderminster? Kitty. Kitty, let's speak to a little kitty, John Reed. <laughs> He's not little at all. John Reed, what do you think? Were we right? Uh, nice to see you, by the way, but were we right? Well, that word, Nana, this is the word, right. Have we got the right? I think I would agree with your panel. I think we've done the right thing, yes. But what is the value of the word right? You know, because what's going on there is, is a, a, all this started off with October the 7th, didn't it? That wasn't right in the first place. And now you look at the response the Israelis have come up with to it, that's not right. That's way too heavy for, for repaying the price of the attack against them. So when we talk about rights in, the, in this particular argument, mm. I'm not sure where that word comes from or what it actually means. But do we stand by our allies? Yes, of course we do. 
Do we think we're still a world power? No, nah, not really. We just help people, don't we? Mm, well, let's hope we can help ourselves as the shoe's on the other foot. John Reid, thank you so much. Really good to talk to you. That's John Reid, our great British voice in Kidderminster. So today I've been asking uh, whether we were right to send jets to Israel. Lots of you have been getting in touch with your views. Robert says, better to send jets to defend Israel and stop further attacks there than allow escalation that will ultimately lead to a wider conflict that would expand globally. Gordon says, why, oh, why do we stick our noses into everyone else's business? Gary says countries need reliable friends. The UK all alone wouldn't even last two minutes. Les says we are not prepared for war overseas. Well, listen, uh, you're with me. I'm Nana Akwe. This is GB News Live on TV, online and on digital radio. Coming up in the next hour, my great British debate. I'm asking, should all British police carry guns? Ooh. Next, though, Worldview. <laughs> Paul Dudridge, uh, Gary Mond and James Marlowe will be live telling us what they think that's wrong with Israel as Iran launched more than 300 drones and missiles in an unprecedented attack. That's next. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So higher pressure out towards the south does bring us some more settled conditions for a time this afternoon, but low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK slowly moves its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of the new week. In the south, though, we will be holding on to those dry conditions for a time this afternoon. Perhaps a bit of late, hazy sunshine around, but it's in the northwest that we see those strongest winds and some blustery showers pushing their way south and eastwards through the early hours of Monday morning. The showers always heaviest across northern and western parts, and we could even see some snow across the hills, and that will lead to quite a chilly night with temperatures in the low single figures here, and even further south, not reaching much above 7 or 8 degrees. So a chilly but blustery start to the day on Monday. The heaviest bands of showers clear their way south and eastwards through Monday morning, leaving some sunny spells as we head in towards the afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and again, these could turn to snow across the Pennines, Lake District, and across the high ground of Scotland. And with a brisk northwesterly breeze, it will be feeling very chilly. Highs in the south not reaching much above 12 or 13 degrees. Tuesday does start a little bit drier for most of us. There will still be a few showers around across Northern Ireland, Wales and northern parts of Scotland, but the best of the sunshine across central northern parts of England and much of mainland Scotland as well. A few showers around still on Wednesday, but there are hints of higher pressure returning later in the week and something a little bit milder on the way. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Uh, welcome on board. It's just coming up to 47 minutes after 4 o'clock. It's time for World View. Uh, Israeli military forces intercepted 99% of the 300 drones and missiles launched by Iran near the Syrian-Iraq border last night, with Israel's Minister of Defence saying the, uh, the confrontation with Iran is not over yet. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says that RAF jets were used to intercept Iran's attack, and he's now set for um, urgent talks with G7 leaders 
as tensions yes, continue yeah. to rise. So joining me now for expert analysis is the chairman of the National Jewish Assembly, Gary Mond, also foreign affairs and defence analyst, James Marlowe. Uh, James Marlowe, I'm going to start with you. Uh, Israel saying it's not over yet. They don't think it's over yet. Uh, yet Iran would like it to end. That way, that's the end of this, rather than it escalating. Where, where do you stand with that? Well, Iran would like it to end for this episode. Mm. It's waiting for the next episode, and it will start up again, but it, in its own time. I was just looking down on my phone to try and get an update on the um, security cabinet meeting, mm. which is still taking place at this point, to find out exactly what their decisions are. I understand, to the best of my knowledge, and the people that I've spoken to, yeah. is that the decision is split within the cabinet as to what to do. Now, from what I understand, and my sources are telling me that President Biden, on that 25-minute conversation over the telephone last mm. night, suggested that this is not the right time to go in and respond. You have the world's support at this point, and therefore just hold back. Now, Netanyahu, at this point, is actually thinking about about this, taking into consideration that the Jewish far, uh, festival of Passover is coming up after mm. next weekend as well, so it would disrupt a whole load of things because that goes on for seven days. But it could be that at this point that Israel is just going to bide its time, mm. assess the situation, it wants to look at Gaza, and of course all this is connected with Iran, Gaza, Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, the missiles coming in. And of course we still have 133 hostages. I say we, well, yeah. from the world's point of view, yeah, because the right. world has condemned this. 133 hostages inside of Gaza, and Israel believes that they're in Rafah, and the time is coming to actually make some type of an incursion into Rafah to look for those that may be there, whether they're alive or dead. Gary Mond. I largely agree with what James has said. However, we actually have to think that there's a great deal of euphoria about what happened last night. It was fantastic to see such support for Israel from Britain, from America and from France. Yet, we, this morning, those nuclear facilities in Iran are still there. They're still moving towards trying to get nuclear weapons. And I'm sure of only one thing. If Iran ever does get nuclear weapons, it would use them. And therefore, at some point, action has to be taken to destroy those nuclear facilities and everything associated with them. But we've, done, we've tried this before, though, haven't we? Tried to destroy people's facility for nuclear weapons, and it's gone wrong. I mean, remember Gaddafi? Well, it's also gone right. It went right in 1981 when Menachem Begin destroyed Saddam Hussein's nuclear facilities. Heaven mm. knows what the world would look like today if Saddam Hussein in 1981 had acquired nuclear weapons. So it can also go right, and it will go right. I think the Israelis have planned this for many, many years, and at some point they need to execute it. I get the feeling that uh, the American president, the American cabinet, and a number of other prominent people mm. are trying to stop Israel from proceeding with such a, a matter. Really? You know, the comments why, from... why would you get that impression? They're stop, trying to stop Israel from defending itself against I Iran or to stop them from getting nuclear weapons. Do you think that that's what the Americans... I'm looking at what Joe Biden said today. You Joe know, Biden... Saying... Joe Biden. Biden saying today to Netanyahu, who's reported in the press, you've got to win, take your win. Mm. No, they haven't got to win. They've managed to avoid defeat, but they need to press ahead and destroy Iran's nuclear facilities. Well, stay right there. I'm going to go over now across the pond to speak to Paul Dudridge, host of the Politics People podcast, because I'm wondering what the uh, thoughts are with the Americans on, on that, because we just heard that Joe Biden is saying that they should take the win. Uh, Paul, w what's your view there in the States, and how is the whole thing being received there? Uh, listen, I think you're covering it beautifully. The, the Biden administration now is uh, trapped, if you like. They, they have now had to state their ironclad support for Israel. And there are many commentators beginning to point out that actually we might see this attack in isolation, but actually Iran would say that this is a retaliation for the attack on the embassy in yeah. Syria the other day. Uh, this has forced the Biden administration in... And remember, just last week, Biden was wavering on support of Israel. That's how it was being reported. There was potential for maybe a bit of a loss of support from the United States. Now he's had to reiterate ironclad support. So I do think that that means that he is some kind of... Um, he can put some kind of pressure on Israel. Biden is losing support from the left of his own party because now he has to redouble his uh, his support of Israel. And that is not the direction that, on a political level, that he wanted to go. Strategically, absolutely right, but politically, it doesn't do him any good. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, let's be honest, he doesn't know what he's talking about, does he? He doesn't even know what day it is. 
Let's be truthful here. I'm going to come back to my uh, panel uh, my, in the studio because, uh, you know, we get the impression... I get the impression Joe Biden doesn't know what day it is. He's not fit to make these decisions, is he? Surely not. Well, if I might just pick up on what was just said over there, the IRGC mm. is recognised as a terrorist group in most Western countries. And that stands for, just so people are all... The Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Mm. Uh, for some reason, it's not registered in this country, although Home Secretaries, previous Home Secretaries have tried, they say, very, very hard to get on the list of pride or uh, prescribed organisations. Uh, for some reason, it's not, but it is in America, it is in the Gulf countries as well. So, as I understand it, that this hits on October... Sorry, not October. So, uh, April, the, April, April Fool's Day. April the 1st, exactly. Yeah. This hit on... Uh, it didn't actually happen in the Iranian consulate. It happened in a building next to it. Okay. And I say that because I was actually given a picture wow. of the building afterwards. I heard which... that. I did hear that. Gary Mond, what's your thoughts? Yes, thought? I'm going back to your question about Joe Biden. It's not Joe Biden who's making the decisions. Sorry, it's the people it? behind him. It may even be Barack Obama. And certainly some prominent Democrats are essentially telling him what to do. I think you're right about Joe Biden. I'm not sure he's fit to be president. <laughs> he's not fit to, for, for purpose at all. Paul Dutch. And whether he's going to be the candidate for the Democrats in November, I don't know. Well, final no. word to Paul Dutch then on that one, because we're talking about Joe Biden. Paul, uh, we don't think he's going to be the candidate for the Democrats. You've suggested it might end up being Michelle Obama. Is that a reality? Yes, listen, every time I use the word Joe Biden, I'm doing Joe Biden, OK? It's not... He's just the front man. He's the, he's the storefront dummy. No, it's the Biden administration is certainly not being run by Joe Biden. Yes, I don't think he's going to be the candidate uh, come November. I've said August. Uh, people are now saying late June he might make it to. But, uh, yeah, we will be seeing him replaced. But this has forced his hand... This is out of his control now, frankly, yeah. and uh, forces are moving behind him that he has no, con never had any control over. He never had any control over anything, not even himself. Paul Dudridge, thank you so much for talking to me. Paul Dudridge, host of the Politics People podcast. Uh, so back to you then. What do you think is the next move for Israel? I'm going to start with you, Gary Mon. Next move for Israel. Well, the cabinet meeting is going on at the moment. Um, what I fear is the next move for Israel is not very much. I think that um, Benjamin Netanyahu has been saying for a long time they're going to go into <coughs> Rafa. I hope they do. Um, and I think that they have to deal with the Iranian nuclear programme. Um, and if they don't, it will be very bad news for Israel in the medium to long run. <coughs> um, but uh, certainly action needs to be taken. James Marlow, final 20 seconds to you. Uh, well, what I would say is that Israel is almost back to normal today. Uh, scores are closed. Score is a working business day on a Sunday. goes from Sunday to Thursday. Um, however, us, people are asked to stay close to their shelters, but nevertheless go on with what it is that you're doing. Uh, there is a ban on crowds more than 1,000 people, for example, a wedding or something like that. The football matches are going ahead later today, although not with large crowds. And um, as I said, I think the airports have opened mm, and so, uh, people so... are flying in and out. Well, so Israel is, is still open for business. They're carrying on with everything. Thank you so much to James Marlowe and Gary Mond. You're with me, I'm Nana Aquir. This is GB News. Still to come, I'll be joined by one of the showbiz's most captivating leading ladies with roles alongside the likes of Peter Sellers and Kirk Douglas and appearances in TV shows like Coronation Street and Mind Your Language. Who do you think she is? A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So higher pressure out towards the south does bring us some more settled conditions for a time this afternoon. But low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK slowly moves its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of the new week. In the south, though, we will be holding on to those dry conditions for a time this afternoon. Perhaps a bit of late, hazy sunshine around, but it's in the northwest that we see those strongest winds and some blustery showers pushing their way south and eastwards through the early hours of Monday morning. The showers always heaviest across northern and western parts, and we could even see some snow across the hills, and that will lead to quite a chilly night with temperatures in the low single figures here, and even further south, not reaching much above 7 or 8 degrees. So a chilly but blustery start to the day on Monday. The heaviest bands of showers clear their way south and eastwards through Monday morning, leaving some sunny spells as we head in towards the afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and again, these could turn to snow across the Pennines, Lake District, and across the high ground of Scotland. And with a brisk northwesterly breeze, it will be feeling very chilly. Highs in the south not reaching much above 12 or 13 degrees. 
Tuesday it does start a little bit drier for most of us. There will still be a few showers around across Northern Ireland, Wales and northern parts of Scotland, but the best of the sunshine across central northern parts of England and much of mainland Scotland as well. A few showers around still on Wednesday, but there are hints of higher pressure returning later in the week and something a little bit milder on the way. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. This is GB News on TV online and on digital radio. Coming up in the next hour, my great British debate. I'm asking, should all British police carry... This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel treats for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello, good afternoon. It's five o'clock. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquia. And for the next hour, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. Coming up, my outside guest. She's a mystery. She was named England's Brigitte Bardot after starring alongside Peter Sellers and Goldie Horn. Any guesses? Come on. Then, for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, should all British police carry guns? What do you think? Now, I've got a, a very exciting uh, guest coming out for my supplement Sunday. I'll be joined by a pensioner who was wrongly accused of hate crimes uh, thanks to Scotland's new hate crime law. But first, let's get your latest news with Ray Addison. Very good afternoon. Good, very good evening, I should say. It's five o'clock. I'm Aaron Armstrong. Uh, the Israeli War Cabinet says it will exact a price from Iran in response to last night's attack when the time is right. It's not clear how Israel will respond, but its War Cabinet says painful, painful sanctions will follow, which could include missiles. 
Iran, meanwhile, says it has now achieved its objective, but has vowed to launch a much bigger attack if Israel does retaliate. Rishi Sunak's confirmed RAF planes did shoot down a number of 300 Iranian drones and missiles that were launched overnight. He says, had it been successful, the fallout for regional stability would be hard to overstate. The Prime Minister is now calling for calm as he prepares to meet with G7 world leaders to discuss the crisis. This was a dangerous and unnecessary escalation, which I've condemned in the strongest terms. Thanks to an international coordinated effort, which the United Kingdom participated in, almost all of these missiles were intercepted, saving lives not just in Israel, but in neighbouring countries like Jordan as well. The RAF sent additional planes to the region as part of our existing operations to counter Daesh in Iraq and Syria. I can confirm that our planes did shoot down a number of Iranian attack drones. I don't want to pay tribute to the bravery and professionalism of our pilots flying into the face of danger. A group of British Iranians have responded to the attack with a demonstration outside the Iranian embassy in London to show solidarity with Israel. We, the British Iranian diaspora, have gathered here today in protest to let the world know that the war of the mullahs, which has started for really, in reality, 45 years, but last night they launched over 300 missiles at Israel, is not the war of the people of Iran. And we are urging the public, the media and the rest of the world to recognise that this is the war of the mullahs and not the war of the people of Iran. Well, more than 120,000 people have crossed the English Channel by small boat since 2018. 219 arrivals were recorded by the Home Office yesterday. The total for this year is now 17% higher than the same period last year. Labour Shadow Immigration Minister Stephen Kinnock has called it another grim milestone. He says Britain must strengthen its border security. Meanwhile, a cabinet minister has insisted the government's Rwanda plan is on track, with flights due to take off Within weeks, Health Secretary Victoria Atkins says the Home Office is ready to go, despite the troubled bill still making its way through Parliament. No airlines being named to transport asylum seekers after a Rwanda state-owned carrier turned down a request. The Prime Minister has repeatedly said the flights would take off by spring, although no date has been set. Labour says it will impose strict 24-hour time limits on police when dealing with serious domestic abuse cases. The initiative's been dubbed Ranim's Law after the 22-year-old Ranim Uda, who was killed by her former partner just 11 days after obtaining an order against him. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says she's sick and tired of the government treating violence against women and girls as inevitable instead of as an emergency. But the government says Labour is soft on crime and doesn't have a plan to tackle it. The knife attacker who killed six people at a shopping centre in Sydney advertised himself online as a male escort and tried to join groups of gun owners. Joel Couchy had been known to police, particularly over the last five years, but hadn't been arrested or charged before yesterday's attack. Police believe the 40-year-old suffered from schizophrenia and used drugs, including methamphetamine and psychedelics. His family's released a statement in support of the police officer who shot and killed him, saying she was only doing her job. A new poll suggests Hamza Youssef's popularity among SNP voters has fallen sharply. A survey of more than 1,000 people in Scotland found the First Minister's score fell to minus 7% amongst those who voted for the Scottish National Party in 2019. His approval with the general public has also dropped to levels similar to his Conservative rivals. It follows the introduction of a new hate crime law, which has prompted more than 7,000 complaints in its first week. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. The QR code's on your screen. Or you can go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, it's back to Nana. Good afternoon. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. For the next hour, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me today is broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly, also author and broadcaster Christine Hamilton. Still to come, each Sunday at five, I'm joined by a celebrity, a former MP or someone who's had an extremely interesting career to take a look at life after the job. We talk highs, lows and lessons learned and what comes next on The Outside. And today, 
I'm joined by a major star of the 70s who has graced our screens in Mind Your Language and Coronation Street. She's known as England's Brigitte Bardot and even rejected a job offer from Kirk Douglas. Wow, any guesses? Then, for the Great British debate this hour, I'm asking, should all British police carry guns? The Sun have reported 18,000 officers were hired without a single in-person interview. Forces continued hiring remotely even after COVID restrictions were lifted. But how are we meant to trust our officers with weapons when they're not even recruited face to face? Then, for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, should British police carry guns? Uh, you can get in touch as ever at gbnews.com forward slash your say. So, Richie Sunak has confirmed UK jets were used to intercept a number of Iranian drones. The Prime Ministers are calling for calm ahead of talks later with other world leaders about de escalating the situation. Israeli defense officials said more than 300 drones and missiles were launched by Iran in an unprecedented attack. It's the first time Iran has targeted Israel directly and from its own soil. Uh, so, there's been a lot of aggression. Iran is threatening a much harder attack if Israel retaliates. Joining me now, Israeli government spokesperson David Menser. Uh, David, thank you so much uh, for talking to me this afternoon. Um, so what, what, what are your thoughts on everything? Because Israel did a phenomenal job alongside its allies in protecting its people. But now what, what's next? Well, firstly, thank you, Nana, for uh, having me join you. Look. Um, Last night, we had 180 suicide drones, 120 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles. And together with our allies, uh, the US and the UK, thanks to uh, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak just confirming uh, before I came on, yes, we managed to miraculously repel that terrorist force. Because you know, the tyrants of Tehran uh, for us, it's not a surprise that they're attacking us because tyrants of Tehran are behind. We're behind the October 7th massacre of my, of my people. But we're ready. We're ready to face them. You know, Iran is the axis behind all the terror in our region. Uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis. Uh, we, we faced them down last night and we're ready for whatever they throw at us defensively and offensively as well. Are Israel right to retaliate after this, though? Because you've had success in that no one was hurt apart from that poor um, seven year old, but nobody else. So we thank God that it wasn't worse. But is it right for Israel to retaliate after this, or would it be wise to perhaps step back and maybe just focus on Gaza and getting your hostages back? Well, look, let's take that part piece by piece. You know, this was a seven-year-old Muslim Israeli Bedouin girl who's mm. fighting for her life in hospital. She didn't deserve to be targeted uh, by Iran. And yes, it is true. We are focused on our mission to destroy Hamas, to bring home all 133 hostages, and, of course, to ensure that Gaza doesn't ever uh, become a threat to us again. But I simply ask you, Nana, and you, all your listeners and all your, your viewers the simple question. What would you do? What would Britain do if 300 deadly missiles came your way? Would you simply, you know, maybe the talk shows here in Israel would say, well, I think Britain should just, uh, just, you know, calm, relax and, you know, turn the other cheek. That's not the way things work here. Iran is our enemy. They have been for many, many years. Just imagine what would have happened if they had nuclear weapons. Mm. The damage would have been so much worse, which is why we will do everything, and I mean everything in our power, to stop them becoming a nuclear weapons power. Well, they would argue that they were responding after the April the 1st attack on some of their uh, commanders at their embassy in Syria. So they claim that that's their response. So if you then, I mean, that's what they're saying. Obviously, they're acting through proxies, Hamas, Houthis and all that lot. But if you then respond after this, then it sounds like they would legitimise having a, an even more ferocious response. Look, Nana, the tyrants of Tehran orchestrated the October 7th massacre uh, of my people. Yeah. Uh, but now the mask is off. Britain knows it. France knows it. The, U, uh, the US has always known it and we're ready to face every single eventuality. They are forces against progress in their region. Uh, the reason that they're fighting us is because we know we are making progress. Before October 7th, we were making real progress mm. in peacemaking this region. 
And that was uh, a threat to them. You, you saw just before I came on again, some of um, Iran's people, not the Iranian regime. We've got no uh, uh, quarrel whatsoever with Iran's peace-loving people. It's their regime which must be stood up to. Yeah. They're after us. They're our enemy. But you can be damn sure, Nana, they're your enemy as well, which means we're on the front line of this civilization, this attack on civilization, and we will be successful because we must be successful. David, thank you so much for talking to me. That's David Mensa. He's an Israeli spokesperson. Really good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Good to be with you, Nana. Thank you. So, in a, the last few minutes, the Shadow Foreign Secretary has spoken. Israel facing a barrage of attack drones overnight, not just Israel, but Jordan, was extremely serious and completely unacceptable. I'm pleased that our armed forces were able to play their part uh, in reducing the risk to life that was considerable last night, and I applaud their bravery and their courage. That was, of course, uh, Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lammy. If you just tuned in, welcome on board. It's just coming up to 13 minutes after 5 o'clock. And each Sunday, around about this time, I'm joined by a celebrity, a former MP, or someone who's had an extremely interesting career to take a look at life after the job. We talk highs, lows and lessons learnt and what comes next on the outside. And this week, my guest is known as England's Brigitte Bardot. She, puts the Mauritius, <coughs> she put Mauritius on the map during the swinging 60s and her career blew up in England. Her big break was starring alongside English comedy icon Peter Sellers and the one and only Goldie Horn. I love Goldie Horn. Throughout her colourful career, she's been uh, told to mind her language. She brought laughs to 18 million viewers across the country. When she's not seen on our screens, she's kept busy with humanitarian work and is now taking uh, to the stage with her latest project, My Wife Fell in Love with a Life-Size Cardboard Cutout of Roland Keating. <laughs> <laughs> Did you work out who she is? I'm joined by model and actress François Pascal. Hello. François, thank you so much for joining me. It's thank really you. good to talk to you. So, François, talk me through uh, your, your career. How did you get into acting? What were your first things? I was actually 16 years old when I, when, when I got into acting. Um, I was... Uh, I did a film for a producer called Bashu Sen, and uh, it wasn't the kind of film that my mother actually <laughs> approved, that's for <laughs> sure. And, uh, and I went on like this, and it just took off, and I had no idea what was happening to me. And my mother had to sign a lot of, uh, you know, contracts and say, OK, she could do, but nobody told her that I would be either half nude or oh nude or whatever. <laughs> it was terrible. It was just terrible. So you became known as the British Brit Bardo. Bardo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's quite a compliment, isn't it? Really? It, is a, it is a compliment. <laughs> it is a compliment, and it, it's it's been it's been a sort of like uh, a roller coaster, yeah. really, of a career. I've got to say, you know, I mean, I've met the most unbelievable people, worked with the most unbelievable well, people. Peter Sellers. So, what, what was he like? Twice. Twice. Worked with him twice. Wow. What's he like? Oh, wonderful. Oh. He was a bit insecure, but hey, listen, you know, big actor, um, ego, and uh, com comedian. You've got to have a, you know, you've got to be insecure. You really? can't be secure. It's, it's, it's funny because when you see them, you're deluded into thinking that they are secure. What about Goldie Hawn? Oh, I gosh. love Goldie Hawn. I love her too. She was oh. wonderful. Lovely lady, and whenever she saw me in Los Angeles, when I lived in Los Angeles for seven years, and whenever she saw me, she would go, Francoise! And I go, Oh my God, who's that? And Goldie, always shouting my name. What was it like then living in Los Angeles and being part of this? It must have been, Wow, pinch yourself, you're there. I, it, it was a very, very different kind of life very different kind of life to London, you know, going from London to Los Angeles. And uh, um, it, it was pretty, pretty severe um, way of, you know, yeah. transition. Mm. Now, you also, uh, you've been on Storage Hoarders as well on ITV1. Yes. You were back on there. Now, I, I used to love watching that. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about your your part in it. My my part was actually getting rid of my partner died. Yeah, and I left uh, Hertfordshire. Um, no, it was 
or Hampshire. And <laughs> I left Hampshire and I had loads of incredible things, you know, and I yeah. go, I can't take it. I can't take all this because I'm in you know, a one bedroom flat in London and all this has got to go. So this is why I, I, I took all my things in storage, especially the ones that reminded me of him, yeah. a lot of him. So I took the, not the most important things, but the things that I really needed to get rid of, yeah. which I did. Oh, so sad though. Can you say how he died? How did he pass? Away? He died of a massive heart attack. Oh no! Yeah, in, in his sleep. That's really sad, isn't mm. it? That's awful. And of course, you have to then deal with all of that. Do you have children? I have one child from somebody else. <laughs> wow! For, from an actor called Richard Johnson, mm -hmm. and I have one child from him, Nicholas. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's... And I have two grandchildren. Two grandchildren as well. Quite, it's, it's great, isn't it? Life's very interesting. I'm 74 years old. <laughs> so you look... I was going to say, you do look incredible, 74 years old. Thank what's, you. What, what is your secret? It's no secret whatsoever. It's my mother. She she gave me that kind of skin. She, you know, I mean, I know how it all happened because she... I don't know if your mother did that, but my mother used to give us cod liver oil every morning. Mm. She used to just put that in our mouth and yes. just swallow it. If we didn't want to swallow it, she'd go... It's <laughs> so horrible, isn't we it? Had, I know. It is actually very good. I might have to get some of that. It's the skin. It's, yeah, it's for the it's, skin. It's, it's very, really, very good yeah. for the skin, actually. Now, you, you've done loads of things. What would you say in your career was the most, you know, the most memorable thing that you did or the thing that left, gave you the, the, left you with the biggest impact? Oh, a, a, a film, a French film called La Rose de Fer, which is in English is The Iron Rose. Mm. And it was my film. Mm. I was starring in it and I, it was mine and, um, and I had one of the guy who actually worked with me and and it was just I, the, I took over the film and I'm so proud of it because it was uh, the, she I studied people who were mentally ill mm. and she became mentally ill so that you was, know. was that what the film was about that's what the film was about she actually they, they were in a cemetery and they got locked up in the cemetery and of course, the cemetery in France are enormous, mm. as you know. Um, you can build about seventy thousand um, houses on in them, and uh, it's just it's to have got lost in there and lost in in you know with the dead and all that. And she got herself lost with the dead. I see. She were there she, others? Was there anybody else there, or was it just her? No, just and her. The cemetery. Wow. Her and the boyfriend. She kills the boyfriend oh, also. No. Yeah. Well, she's on it's her own. Now. What's she she no, because she was she was actually you know with the, the dead, the dead people. <laughs> she loved oh. the dead people around. So she wanted him to be one of them. As <laughs> what well. exactly? <laughs> Odd woman. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> then. What's that film called? I've got that was the fair, the, the Iron Rose. Oh wow! And it was by a very very well known uh, director called Jean Rollin. Mm. He was a, a cult director. Mm. He was a real... Did you want to get into acting? Because I often ask whether your reality actually um, it, it was greater than your dreams, because you may have dreamt... Did, what did you dream of becoming? And Never dreamt about anything wow. else but... Oh, did you? I saw a film with Romy Schneider. Do you, know, do, you remember, do you know Romy Schneider? I saw a film with her about the Elizabeth of um, Austria, mm. and I dreamt of being Elizabeth of Austria. I dreamt every single scene that I saw in that film. Mm. Absolutely dreamt every one of them and, and I loved it yeah and here you are now you are doing you did you lived your you're living your dream what are you doing now though because at the moment I know you've got your 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 thing that you're doing yeah, well I'm doing this play um, which is very controversial incredibly controversial and it's very politically it's it's a trans transgender trans I could never say the word transgender um, play oh. uh, the, the, my granddaughter, who plays well, the girl who plays my grand great granddaughter, actually is a trans a trans. <laughs> Oh, trans. do help me, please. You can say trans. You'll be trans, all right. A tra trans. Thank you. It's trans. trans, trans, trans. trans. <laughs> you I'm a little nervous, trans. so... <laughs> you can say trans. I'm trans, sure yes. That would not so, uh, and, and she, you know, and it's that, and it's also... Uh, and it, it is a play about a woke... Uh, Oh, I mean, the, the, the woke society oh, disease, nice. you know, this is what we are about today, is the woke society disease. And I'd like to bring that out and saying, really, we do not want you around. <gasps> we do really? not want... You mean the woke society? The woke society. We do yes. not want that, you know. I mean, let us live our life the way we were living all the time. Why do we have to change just because we want to, uh, to please 
other people. We don't want to please other people. I mean, we want to actually please ourselves. Oh, this sounds a great play. I it can't is. can't wait to see it. What's, it is quite what's funny. it called and where can people go and see it? Right, and it is called uh, My Wife Fell in Love with the Carbook. <laughs> That's not, no, that's not. <laughs> with a cardboard copy of Ronan Keating, and uh, and the play is actually the box office is open at in May, on May the first, and <laughs> it is a, I love this cardboard copy. It's cut out. It's a cut out it's copy. It's a cardboard cut out of Ronan Keating. Cut out of Ronan Keating. Ronan Keating if yes. If you're listening on radio. You, yes, exactly. And uh, and and, she, and the, the the tickets office is open on on May the first. Nice. And you can actually have it online, which is www.kt.net. Right. Well, listen, I, I think it sounds fantastic. That, so, remind me of the title again. My wife fell in love with <laughs> My the wife fell in love with the Conard copy of Garuda and Keating. Well, let's hope he, he says something about it, because it would be great if he tweets it or you should, <laughs> you should let him know. He might show I up. I would love it. I, I hope up, he's so watching much. this. <laughs> <laughs> well, he might be. Listen, Ronan, if you're watching, you know, she's doing a great... It's, uh, somebody fell, fell in love with you, the cardboard cut out of you. you should, he'll hopefully he'll retweet that. And, and it also makes dinner for you, too. Oh, does he? <laughs> oh, I love a man that can cook the way to my heart. No, 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 it's the woman cook. Oh, the woman, uh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not Ronan. Well, listen, uh, Francoise, thank you so much for joining me. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you. I Lovely to talk to you, too. All the best with your play. Thank you so much. Sounds fascinating. I'm, I, I'm enjoying it. And I'm going to go and watch your uh, movie as well. Oh, the other one as well, the one in, about the dead people. I thought that sounds quite <laughs> impressive. <laughs> okay. so that, that, of course, is Francoise Pascal. Wow. Well, listen, if you've just tuned in, welcome on board. That was my mystery outside guest. Did you guess it was her? 22 minutes after five. Coming up, I've got a special supplement Sunday. Joining me, pensioner, a pensioner who was arrested after she was wrongly accused of a hate crime in Scotland. But next, it's time for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, should all British police carry guns? This is GB News. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. I don't think you can go and watch a Shakespeare play unless you already know it. It's yes. almost like you have to understand the story and the, the characters yeah. and perhaps have even done a bit of reading into it. Because if you went completely blind, especially in today's world where we don't speak in that kind of way, um, it is, I think, probably a bit alienating. But don't, don't want to say it is alienating at the moment because of the lack of uh, representation. I, you know what, the actual phrasing they use, right, OK. The disproportionate representation um, propagated white able-bodied heterosexual cisgender male narratives I'm sure there's people sitting in a room going what's the most ridiculous thing we can come up with together yes. but really just chuck all these words and it. it's cisgender and it's just insane mm. of course Shakespeare was what it was back in the day and that's why it is it's mostly blokes and they're mostly white and lots of speculation that he was actually gay isn't there because he never really saw Anne Hathaway very often and stayed away a lot of the time. I don't know, he, maybe he was a big He might have been transgender icon. for all I, I know. I mean, I, I don't... I... <laughs> Begins, I'm looking at you. No, I think you're right. I mean, you know, I think uh, you know, that goes for the profession too. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, it's... Uh, I, I, I do think we... I mean, I remember seeing Macbeth in London with Judi Dench and Ian McKellen, and it was one of the most exciting wow. evenings ever. And it was a cold night in the Donmar Theatre, outside and inside, and it, that gave it atmosphere. There are certain things, and then you go along and see something else, and you think, I'll walk out in the interval. Yeah. Macbeth is, is so a bad. sexy play, though. Let's talk about, um, oh, there's so many. Can I live to be 100? Oh, um, this is depressing. I think it is depressing. Oh. I like to stay here and now. I don't want to live to 100. Oh, don't and say I'm that. right behind you. I don't you. even want to. My father died at 63. That'll be me gone this year. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, 26 minutes after five. This is GB News. I'm Nana Aquea. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. And don't forget, you can also stream the show live on YouTube as well. It's time now for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, should all British police carry guns? In Australia, all police officers carry them. And the Australian officer who shot the stabbing suspect in Sydney has been hailed a hero. But in the UK, most police do not routinely carry firearms. Some might say that that's for the best. After The Sun reported that 18,000 officers were hired without a single in-person interview. Forces continued hiring new recruits via Zoom even after COVID restrictions were lifted. How on earth can the public trust officers who's with weapons if they're not even recruited face to face? So for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, should all police carry guns? Well, I'm joined now by author and broadcaster Rebecca Reid, former Met Detective Mike Neville, author and commentator Nishi Hodgson, also former Met Police Officer Chris Hobbs. Well, so I'm going to start with you, Chris Hobbs. What, what's, what are your thoughts? And, you know, because you, you've been in the police force, so where, where do you th what do you think about this? Well, actually, many years ago, I was an authorised shot for the Met. Uh, it wasn't as high standards as you have to have now to get in, mm. but I was one. And then there was an incident in the West End where... A, misidentification of a suspect resulted in being shot oh, no. a number of times by two officers. Oh, God, did they kill him? They didn't kill him, but it was a huge scandal at the time. I won't mention his name, mm. but um, it, was, it was massive. The two officers were put on trial. They were acquitted months later. And months after that, I saw one of the officers in a police canteen. I barely recognised him. He'd aged about 20 years because of the stress of that particular incident and mm. what followed. Mm. After that, I said, I don't fancy this. And I basically didn't renew my authorisation. I didn't go for what they called a reclassification. I did not want the stress and the strain. So from that point of view, I can see why a number of officers would be very reluctant to mm. take up firearms. And the problem we've got is that some, if they were forced to, every officer had to carry a gun, would leave the police. Mm -hmm. We'd suffer as well with recruitment of officers. And at the moment, of course, the Met and all forces are struggling to recruit and retain officers. Mm -hmm. So there are huge issues. You can't just simply say everyone's going to be armed. And, of course, we probably would get more incidents. Having said that, when there is an incident like we saw in Sydney or in Paris or that we saw in London or Reading, you really need armed officers well, exactly. to be there as and, soon as possible. And also the response times are not good either. Former Met Detective Mike Neville, your thoughts? Well, I was, uh, I was in the military police first, so I routinely carried uh, a pistol mm. and sometimes a, a submachine gun in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, but as has been said, you know, to force everybody to do this, I think there should be uh, an option for officers to uh, uh, carry a weapon because we, we're in an archaic situation. We're the only country in the world who uh, don't have armed officers. People often compare us with like what happens in the States, for example. But, of course, you've just mentioned places like Australia are probably more comparable to the UK. All the units, all the uh, uh, officers are routinely armed. But there needs to be some legal protections here. We're asking people to make life changing decisions and then we can't be charging every officer with murder uh, and after the uh, you know got the uh, the murder trial coming up the uh, where chris carver was shot an officer who mm -hmm. made a split second decision being charged with murder 
what family would want their uh, loved one to go to work and have to make those decisions who might end up being locked up for life so it's to my mind you know we trust surgeons but sometimes surgeons uh, make uh, mistakes and people die on the operating table we accept these are high risk situations uh, the, with the type of uh, suspect in australia if somebody's uh, completely frenzied on drugs or drunk or very mentally ill then the facts are that tasers and batons often don't work but a, no. a bullet does you know yeah. and that saved a lot of lives but we're asking people to make very decent very difficult decisions and they should be supported mm. okay nisi hodgson for treatment and in terms of trust from the public and i think fundamentally if you start arming all officers then you have a massive problem with trust between them and the public at a time when people don't have a lot of faith in the police and you know like we've got we've got so many examples you know i, I used to live in stockwell uh jean charles de menezes do you remember him 2005 he was wrongly suspected of a terrorist offense and was shot in the head he was a brazilian man and uh you know his family never got over that that was a decision that was made wrongly by a unit. If you have every single officer being forced to carry a weapon, we've got to be realistic. Some of those people don't want to do it and some of them are not good enough to do it. And I think the other issue is that we talk a lot about weapons in circulation in the UK. The more weapons you have in circulation, even amongst the police, the greater the chances of those falling into the wrong hands, i.e. gang members. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thought. Let's go to Rebecca Reid. Rebecca Reid, what do you think? Um, I think in 2023, 1,500 Met officers, like uh, working police officers, were accused of crimes of violence against women. So if all of those 1,500 men, if even 1% were guilty, that means 15 men were guilty against violence against women, them having guns at work just yes. doesn't feel right. And I don't, I think whether you're left or right, nobody in this country seems to think the police is going well. The left think that they're too hard, often racist. The right think that they are incompetent and spend too much time wearing rainbow flags. But either way, nobody feels I think in this country like policing is nailing it so the idea that to give them weapons that can kill people would be the cure to that problem feels very very unlikely mm. so Rebecca Reid yes or no then should police uh, be given guns our police absolutely yes. absolutely you know I think it would be a disaster for everybody involved Nishi, police Nishi, Nishi, Nishi yes or yeah. no yes no, you think they should... no definitely not no no definitely not uh, Mike Neville yes or no yes if they want to carry them mm. because they'll save lots more lives than will be lost and finally, to you, Chris, yes or no? No. No, no. Well, listen, that's interesting. Thank you so much for your thoughts, Chris Hobbs, um, also Nishi Hodgson, uh, Rebecca Reid, and also uh, Mike Neville. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, what do you think at home? gbnews.com forward slash your say. Uh, get in touch. We know we'd love to hear what you think about all of that. Uh, but you're with me, I'm Nana Aquil. This is GB News. Coming up, we'll continue with the Great British Debate this hour. I'm asking, should all British police carry guns? But first, let's get your latest news with Aaron. Hi there, it's 5.33. I'm Aaron Armstrong. Iran risks provoking an uncontrollable regional escalation. The words of G7 leaders who've condemned the attack last night against Israel and reaffirmed their commitment to Israeli security. Now, G7 leaders are demanding Iran and its proxies cease their attacks and they say they'll continue to work towards stabilising the situation. It comes after the Israeli war cabinet said it will exact a price from Iran for its overnight assault, including in the form of missiles. Iran, meanwhile, says it will launch a much larger attack if Israel retaliates. However, President Biden has warned his Israeli counterpart, Benjamin Netanyahu, the United States won't take any part in retaliatory strikes. Rishi Tunak has confirmed RAF planes did shoot down a number of Iranian drones and missiles overnight in what he's described as a dangerous escalation in the region. Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lamy is urging the government to issue sanctions against Iran's Revolutionary National Guard. This highlights once again the extreme danger of the IRGC and the Iranian Guard. Uh, we have said that we think that it should be prescribed and it is for the government to come forward with new plans to prescribe them and to deal with this issue of state actors that would behave in this appalling way that wreaks terror on a wider community. More than 120,000 people have crossed the English Channel by small boats since 2018. 
219 arrivals were recorded by the Home Office yesterday. The total for this year is now 17% higher than the same period last year. Labour's shadow immigration, Minister Stephen Kinnock has called it another grim milestone. He says Britain must strengthen its border security. Well, Labour says it will impose strict 24-hour time limits on police when dealing with serious domestic abuse cases. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says she's sick and tired of the government treating violence against women and girls as inevitable. The government says Labour is soft on crime and doesn't have a plan to tackle it. You can sign up to GB News Alerts. For more on all of our stories, the QR code's on your screen or the information's also on the website. Now it's back to Nana. Thank you, Aaron. In my special supplement Sunday, I'll be joined by a pensioner who was arrested after she was wrongly accused of a hate crime in Scotland. But next, it's time to continue with the Great British Debate this hour, and I'm asking, should all police carry guns? GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Cheryl Baker, good morning, Cheryl. Good morning. When you think back to 1981, um, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the ABBA <laughs> victory then wasn't all that long ago, nine years earlier. Do, do you think they had a huge influence then on the sort of direction that, that Eurovision was taking? Yeah, they did. They changed it completely. Because up to then, it had all been very staid and a bit posh, long frock, sticky bow ties, you know. And then they came along and they blew it out of the water. They looked so different. And they modernised it. And I think, yeah, it, it, it made a big change. Made a big change after that. Mm. And we were watching your performance on Eurovision a little bit earlier on of Making Your Mind Up. I mean, you had so much fun, didn't you, up on that stage. Were you, in some part, inspired by ABBA? Um, yes, I would say so. It was... ABBA was 74. I turned professional in 75 and um, did my first song for Europe, which was, you know, the when they choose the British song to go forward. Um, I did my first one in February 1976. So, yeah, it was only months after ABBA's performance that I um, I started my own Eurovision journey. Um, yeah, they, they just changed the face of it. They changed the face of Eurovision. And if you look at what Eurovision is now, I think that all started with ABBA's performance. It made people think this is much more than just a song contest. It's all about the look. I mean, the clothes, they looked fantastic. And even the composer, or not the composer, what's he called, the conductor, he was dressed as Napoleon. It, was, it made it fun. Fantastic song, obviously, brilliant singing. But the whole look of it just changed the way that Eurovision is, and, and to this day. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon. If you just tuned in, where have you been? There's only 21 minutes to go. <laughs> I'm Nana Aquila. This is GB News. We are the People's Channel. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. And don't forget to download the GB News app. It's totally free. But it's time now for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, should all British police carry guns? <clears throat> in the UK, most police do not routinely carry firearms. And some would argue that's for the best. After The Sun reported that some 18,000 officers were hired without a single in-person interview. In Australia as well, you saw what happened there. All police officers are armed. And the officer who shot the knifeman that killed six people in Sydney yesterday has been hailed a hero. 
So for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, should all police carry guns? Well, joining me, my panel, uh, broadcaster and author Christine Hamilton and also broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly. Christine Hamilton. No, it's rightfully I'm British for the police to carry guns, rightfully. isn't it? Frankly, I'm British. No, I don't think they should. I mean, the argument, you know what the arguments are for and against, and I just think, on balance, I think it would encourage more criminals to carry guns and, therefore, we would probably end up with more people dead. Um, but, by the way, that business of all those police officers being hired without even a face-to-face -face interview, I'm not defending it, but it was during COVID. No, they carried on after. Did they carry on yeah, afterwards? I mean, but they how carried can on. you no possibly excuse. appoint a police officer with all the responsibility, <laughs> etc., without having a face-to-face -face interview? It, 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 <laughs> it's, it's like... And then give them a gun. And then give them a gun. <laughs> I mean, you know... So, I know I, the, the, enough policemen do damn stupid things for me to be very worried indeed if they all had a gun. Give them tasers, give them everything they need to defend themselves, but not a completely lethal weapon like well, a, a gun. Well, and, and a baton, they can all be lethal weapons. Danny Kelly. But, I, I would go with the Australian model. I think one of your guests earlier said that we're the only country that doesn't have routinely armed coppers. I, I don't think that's true. New Zealand doesn't. No. Even in the Republic of Ireland, you don't routinely. In, in Northern Ireland, you do, but the uh, mm. Republic, you don't. Uh, I, I wouldn't have a problem with it. My only concerns would be, like, if they were sent to some massive pub brawl in the middle of some council estate in the West Midlands, where I've travelled from today, at 3 in the morning, people punching and all of a sudden some idiot grabs the gun. That would be a concern of mine, but they have idiots brawling in Australia at three in the morning well, in council well, estates. Well, listen, one of our producers who um, says who lives, lives in Australia said uh, that actually the police end up shooting more innocent people mm. than the people they're Do after. They? Yeah, I think it's a slippery yeah. slope. Apparently the public view is changing. In, in 2004, it was about 50-50, 48% uh, no for guns. And in... 2017, that had changed to 72% thought no. the police should be armed. That's no, 72% thought that the people are beginning to think the police should be armed. I wonder if it'll say that on our poll. I doubt it. I wouldn't think <laughs> so. I mean, I we've, we've got... The, most of the armed police are in the Met, as I understand. We've got about 6,500... Mm. armed police mm. in the country. Sure, they don't get paid any extra as well, the volunteers. They don't get paid any more dough well, I, I to would, be an armed copper. Well, I think they should do that and have an exam, be paid more, have an exam, and actually loads of training if they're going to carry them. But let's see what you think, because the show is nothing without you and your views. Let's welcome our great British voices, their opportunity to be on the show and tell us what they think about the topics we're discussing. Let's see who I've got today. Let's go... I've got three of you. Lee Webb in Bedfordshire. Should they carry guns? I, I actually believe that they should, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if their training's good enough, it shouldn't be a problem. They were no longer Dixon of Doc Green. Um, them days are long over. We're probably not going to get them back. I've actually carried um, a weapon on the British streets um, when I served in Northern Ireland. So mm. I know what it's like working with people from the RUC, which is now known as the Police Service in Northern Ireland. And they're still routinely armed. Um, and I think if it's a voluntary basis where if police want to be armed, they should be armed and they should be allowed to be armed. Um, but it's all about the training and it doesn't need to look like America. We can be European about this and we can be Australian as well. All right, cool. Let's go to uh, Brian Dugan in Solihull. Brian. Hey, Nana, how are you doing? All um, right. I think, I think I'm with you on this. Um, I would be sceptical uh, at best. I, I, I just fear that it, it leads only to a kind of escalation. Uh, I don't think it uh, it really helps. Even in America, I don't think that any of the uh, statistics would, would show that it um, it leaves the police in a better spot in any way to tackle crime. Mm. Um, uh, you know, they get shot and killed, unfortunately, as well. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we, we have a police... We are policed kind of by consent in this country. That's been the tradition. And, and, and you think uh, we should keep it that way? I think we should keep it that way. I don't think that they. I don't think that it's uh, an overriding uh, plus uh, to uh, an overwhelming plus, rather, to armor armor police. All right, let's let's go to Julie. Julie in Bedfordshire. Julie. Yeah, hi. I agree with Brian and yourself. I don't think at this stage we need to be having all of our officers armed. Um, the firearms officers that do carry guns, they are specifically trained in how to use that weapon. And there is somebody also with them making a decision on when to shoot. I think if you armed everybody, and like Danny said, if they come up to a brawl and actually it's just fisticuffs and somebody panicking, new to the job, draws out their gun, you could end up seeing more innocent people shot on the streets mm -hmm. than, than we do at the moment. 
I say, hell no way should they be carrying guns at all. <laughs> Thank you so much to Brian, Julie, and also Lee. Lovely to talk to them. My great British voice is fabulous. God, no. Today I've been asking, should all police carry guns? Lots of you have been getting in touch. Let's see what Paula says. Yes, yes, arm our police. Are you mad, Paula? No, no. George <laughs> says, do not recruit people who are not prepared to carry weapons. Really? Michelle says, no, I don't trust the police anymore. Nelson says, the youngsters in today's police force fail to, in common sense, they'd probably shoot themselves in the foot. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. But thank you so much for your thoughts. Coming up, Supplement Sunday, my panel and I will discuss some of the news stories that caught their eye. And this week, I've got a special guest, a pensioner who was arrested after she was wrongly accused of a hate crime. Stay tuned. This is GB News. Good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So higher pressure out towards the south does bring us some more settled conditions for a time this afternoon, but low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK slowly moves its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of the new week. In the south, though, we will be holding on to those drier conditions for a time this afternoon. Perhaps a bit of late, hazy sunshine around, but it's in the northwest that we see those strongest winds and some blustery showers pushing their way south and eastwards through the early hours of Monday morning. The showers always heaviest across northern and western parts, and we could even see some snow across the hills, and that will lead to quite a chilly night with temperatures in the low single figures here, and even further south, not reaching much above 7 or 8 degrees. So a chilly but blustery start to the day on Monday. The heaviest bands of showers clear their way south and eastwards through Monday morning, leaving some sunny spells as we head in towards the afternoon. There will still be plenty of showers around, though, and again, these could turn to snow across the Pennines, Lake District, and across the high ground of Scotland, and with a brisk northwesterly breeze, it will be feeling very chilly. Highs in the south not reaching much above 12 or 13 degrees. Tuesday does start a little bit drier for most of us. There will still be a few showers around across Northern Ireland, Wales and northern parts of Scotland, but the best of the sunshine across central northern parts of England and much of mainland Scotland as well. A few showers around still on Wednesday, but there are hints of higher pressure returning later in the week and something a little bit milder on the way. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon. It's almost the end of the show, 48 minutes after 5 o'clock. I'm Nana O'Quare. It's time for Supplement Sunday, where my panel and I discuss some of the news stories that caught their eye. I'm going to start with Danny Kelly and his supplement. Danny Kelly, well, what have you got? Well, let me tell you something now. This is no surprise. Richard Hammond, ex-Top Gear, now Amazon Prime star, is saying, basically, you know, the government wants us all to drive their lecky cars by 2030. He says in 25 years' time, 2050... Most of us will still be driving petrol. Not a surprise to me. Yeah, the yeah. Alecky car market is not, generally speaking, wanted or desired no. by the motoring public. Generally speaking. I'm not buying one. I don't want one. No, I'm, sick I'm not petrol. buying Nobody's one. telling no. me what exactly. I should be driving. Nobody tells me what to do. No, no, Christine. It's ridiculous. He's absolutely right. Well, this is just mind-blowing. Offering a chair to an older colleague at work is age discrimination. So, if either of you 
offered a chair to me to sit down because I'm older than you, I could legitimately say that you're discriminating against me. This was at an employment tribunal and I could claim of having less favourable treatment because you were kindly saying that your legs are older, you might prefer to sit down. I mean, it is unbelievable. A 66-year-old guy who was a recycling plant operative, he sued for discrimination after a colleague asked him if he wanted to sit down no. during the shift. I mean, you... Honestly, you couldn't you make, it make it up. It's unwanted conduct. Well, I'm sorry, but if there's anybody out there who sees me on the train and I haven't got a seat, please give up the seat. Get up and give I a do seat. not regard it as unwanted Was he unwanted successful, attention. Well, we'll find out. But I don't think we know that. Well, listen, you will find out. But first, a pensioner... <clears throat> it's my turn now. A pensioner was arrested <laughs> in Scotland after she was wrongly accused of a hate crime. 74-year-old Morag McDougall-Brown says that she's traumatised following the incident. And she joins me now. Morag, thank you so much for joining me. So, Morag, what happened? Um, on Tuesday morning, two officers appeared at my door that I knew from previous incidents. They had been here and um, they said they were here to arrest me um, and I asked why they couldn't tell me. Um, they said they would need to take me to an interview room at a police station. Um, all they could say was it's an allegation. So I was unaware of what was happening to me. Um, I said, what happens if I don't come? They said, we'd need to handcuff you. What? Uh-huh. And uh, I asked them then to go out to the van and just wait for me coming out. It, it was just something I had to do. Um, and they did that. Now, they were very, very nice to me. Yeah. I must be honest. They kept asking if I was OK because they were aware of the two years that I've had harassment, abuse, etc. And um, they took me to Kilmarnock Police Station, which is about 25 minutes away. Mm. And... Um, Sorry, Nan. That's all right, Maura. Right? It must have been so traumatising. I want to be around. And, and this was because I think it was a neighbour or somebody had claimed that you had said something, but it wasn't you at all. It was actually no. them. I hadn't even spoken to her. Wow. She'd actually... I'd seen her that day out in the back garden. She was pulling down my rose bush. And I took a photograph for the kitchen. Never went out the door. Yeah. Um, so she must have thought that I was going to report that. So she spawned the police and made up this lie that I called her. Well, that's, it's awful, more. I mean, obviously, she's not here to defend herself, so we won't talk too much about her. We're more concerned about you, Morag. So, just uh -huh. finally, how ridiculous do you think these Scottish hate crime laws are if someone can do that? I think it's awful because she could maybe do that tomorrow and I could be taken away again oh. because they said that they can't interview me in my own home because of the new law. They had to take me to a police station. But I was searched, I was read my rights. Oh, more, the jewellery just... was taken off me and then it was only in the interview room that they told me it was an allegation that my neighbour had made a complaint and said that I'd called her that name. Well, listen, Morag, we, we love you. We think you're amazing. Uh, it does demonstrate the ridiculousness of Hamza Youssef's awful hate crime laws. And I'm so thankful that you joined me on my show today. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, Morag. Thank you, Nana. We love you. You're amazing. You. Mwah. Take care of yourself. Bye. Thank you so much for agreeing to do that. Bye-bye. 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 That, that is the brilliant Morag McDougall-Brown. I've got to say... Thank you so much to Carol Law and also Al Mulhern from the Appreciation Group on Facebook for uh, getting more reg to, uh, to, for getting me in touch with Morag. Much appreciated. Thank you. But listen, on today's show, we've been asking, should all British police carry guns? According to our Twitter poll, 65% of you said yes. What? 35% of you say no. Are you mad? No. No. Well, that's what they think. What do you think? Crikey. Well, listen, I've got to say a huge thank you. You, you did, didn't you? I've got to say a huge thank you to my panel broadcaster and journalist, Danny Kelly. Danny Kelly, thank you so much for you. You're very welcome. And also broadcaster and author, Christine Hamilton. 
And as ever, a huge thank you to you at home for your company. I look forward to seeing you same time, same place uh, on Saturday, 3 o'clock. Be there or be square. Enjoy your week. Take care. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather from the Met Office. So there has been plenty of showers around in the north, all thanks to an area of low pressure situated out towards the north of the UK at the moment, but it will slowly move its way towards us through the rest of the weekend and into the start of Monday. Higher pressure does stay close by towards the south and west for a time, bringing some clear skies through the Sunday evening. But those showers in the north and west slowly push their way south and eastwards as we go through the early hours of Monday morning, turning particularly heavy across northern parts of England. And we could even see some snow across the high ground of Scotland. And it will be a chilly night here, temperatures dropping into the low single figures and even in the south around 7 or 8 degrees. Monday starts a bit chilly, but quite a blustery start to the day. Nor brisk northwesterly winds help clear that band of rain across the southeast through Monday morning, leaving a drier day. There will be some sunshine around, but some showers quite quickly developing from the northwest. These turning wintry across the high ground of northern England and Scotland, and it will be a much chillier day than we've seen over the weekend. Struggling to reach much above 12 or 13 in the south, and even struggling to reach double figures in the north. Tuesday does start a bit drier for most of us, though. There will be plenty of sunshine through the morning. Still the odd one or two showers around across northern and western parts and perhaps a few bubbling up across eastern parts of England. But there should be plenty of sunshine around. However, temperatures still close to average. Still a few showers around on Wednesday and Thursday, but there are hints of something more settled later in the week and temperatures returning closer to average. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions,